This is section zero of excerpts from a bibliography of the work of Mark Twain, Samuel Langhorne Clemens. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Excerpts from a bibliography of the work of Mark Twain, Samuel Langhorne Clemens. Compiled by Merle Johnson. Read by John Greenman. Introductory Samuel Langhorne Clemens, who lived and wrote under the pseudonym Mark Twain, was born in Florida, Missouri, November 30, 1835, and died in Redding, Connecticut, April 21, 1910. This bibliography of his printed work is not the place for an extended resume of the literary value of his output. It is rather a catalogue to facilitate the researches of the many, present and future, interested in his writings. Little attempt will be made to distinguish between the individual characteristics of the various books or articles with regard to the quality of humor, moral teaching, interest, or probable value. Mark Twain has been variously regarded as merely an entertaining humorist and as a great and profound philosopher. His own point of view probably changed with the years as his mental horizon changed and widened. A preface to one of his early works states, I am not offering this work to the reader as either law or gospel upon any point, principle, or subject, but only as a trifle to occupy himself with when he has nothing to do and does not wish to whistle. Yet most of his very latest work was controversial and philosophical, and just before his death he wrote, I like myself best when I am serious. Personally, I regard most of his better-known works as Americana of the greatest value, as impossible to duplicate as the paintings of Remington depicted an age that has vanished. Those books portray the making of the nineteenth-century American, his whimsical humor and exaggeration, his roughness, his firmness, his ready sympathy, his strength, his weakness, from boyhood to old age. They are history, as the Dickens books are history, in the best sense of all. Mark Twain's literary production covered a period of practically five decades, his range of activities included newspaper, magazine, book, and speech. He lived in a dozen places, from Honolulu to Vienna. Europe, Canada, and the United States vied for the first publication of his work. These things together, with the immense volume of publication, render it practically impossible to make these lists technically complete. Yet the Twain lover will find here sufficient exact data for the broad founding of his collection. Such additional information and correction as may be necessary will but add zest to his pursuit. In these pages, after the usual fashion of bibliographies, most importance is given to the first printings in book form. No attempt will be made to be didactic or arbitrary. Facts will be stated as far as obtainable but some conclusions must necessarily remain matters of opinion. In search of information, I have examined almost every available source, libraries, private collections, and have interviewed numbers of publishers, printers, and book dealers. It must be taken into account that the bulk of Mark Twain's work was published before the date of international copyright, and his popularity made him the victim of pirates of every degree. Whatever the author's feelings on the subject may have been, these pirated works are of as much importance to the collector as those regularly copyrighted. Naturally, the printing dates of these pirated works can be found in no such regular channels as government records. Even the government reports of the copyright editions have been incomplete. Many books filed in government offices at time of printing have been lost. Of some of the early books, publishers, printers, binders, illustrators, all lie in their graves, and Mr. Clemens himself 
never had the collector's interest in remarking the fine differences between editions so necessary to state exactly in a bibliography neither author nor publishers felt the importance of preserving the first copies from the press often it has been the cataloguer's only resource to search for a presentation volume containing a written date within a few days of the presumable first printing and then compare page by page with an acknowledged second edition in the same form to discover and tabulate variances it will be only by accident or by most unremitting search that the exact dates of printing of many pirated editions in canada and england will become known no arbitrary rules have been attempted in this bibliography for the acceptance or rejection of freak publications no fine distinctions drawn between cloth leather or paper-bound books pamphlets annuals etc each publication is listed for its own worth and the distinctions must remain somewhat a matter of personal opinion the largest point at issue for the collector who does not wish to be omnivorous in his purchases lies between the english and american editions in most cases the canadian publications can be eliminated as firsts because the english editions preceded them many bibliophiles claim with authority that the collector should choose for a preferential set those books published in the author's own country even if some of the items have been previously issued in another country in the twain case nearly all the books were first issued in england some pirated but most by arrangement for purposes of copyright protection before the passage of the present act twain's first book the jumping frog was published in authorized form by rutledge in england some months after the american appearance one john camden houghton seeing possibilities in the new author not only reprinted that material but pounced upon innocence abroad and had it upon the english market long before the routledge authorized edition next the voracious mr houghton seized the memoranda from the galaxy magazine and put it into book form it is probable that the author had been most concerned with the work of production and the returns from the home market kept the wolf far from the door but word from across the sea made him take notice of the increasing circulation of his work there without corresponding gain to himself here is his own account of the steps he took for self-protection the english courts have held that under certain circumstances prior publication in great britain will give an author copyright in england whatever his nationality may be you are an american if you want to copyright a book here at home what must you do this you must get your title page printed on a piece of paper enclose it to the librarian of congress apply to him in writing for a copyright send him a cash fee that is what you personally have to do the rest is with your publisher what do you have to do to get the same book copyrighted in england you are hampered by no bothers no details of any kind whatever when you send your manuscript to your english publisher you tell him the date appointed for the book to issue here and trust him to bring it out there a day ahead isn't that simple enough no letter to any official no title page to any official no fee to anybody and yet that book has a copyright on it which the charleston earthquake couldn't unsettle previous publication in great britain of an american book secures perfect copyright whether his awakening to the value of the english market was due to his trip to england in eighteen seventy two or his trip was due to his awakening is uncertain 
The latter is indicated by newly written prefaces, dated Hartford, July 1872, to an authorized edition of Innocents Abroad, printed in London. In this he states, Any American likes to see the work of his hands achieve a friendly reception in the mother country, and it is but natural, natural too, that he should prize its kindly reception there above the same compliment extended by any other people than his own. Our kindred blood and our common language, our kindred religion and political liberty, make us feel nearer to England than to other nations, and render us more desirous of standing well there than with foreign nationalities that are foreign to us in all particulars. So without any false modesty or consciousness of impropriety, I confess to a desire that Englishmen should read my book. Something a little less altruistic than the above seems to have been actuating him, however, for the device of previous publication was invoked to protect the just-written roughing it, and a wordy war took place between Twain and Houghton through the columns of the Spectator, and soon Houghton ceased to be a factor in the printing of new material. This practice of previous publication forces the collector, who does not wish parallel sets, to a choice between the actual first printings from abroad and the American first printings, with the addition, of course, of the items not printed in America. Many American collectors up to the present date have thought necessary to include in their sets London copies of The Prince and the Pauper and Huckleberry Finn because of the predating of those items, not having the information that those selected books were merely on a par with twenty other books published a few days previous to the American issue for copyright reasons, and not a whit more important to the collection. It is almost impossible to draw the line between the permanent and the fugitive, the valuable and the trivial, in the immense volume of written, spoken, and anecdotal Twain material. Most authors sit them down in their studies to produce any work of value. It has to be considered, written and rewritten, and is then given to the public in so-called permanent form. Much of Mark Twain's work, of course, was in the carefully wrought form, yet his literary product was an inborn method of thought, a point of view, a philosophy of life, which was just as apt to flash at full value in a hasty note to an acquaintance as in the most studied production. Several of his speeches are included in his collected works. Most of his shorter pieces were contributions to newspapers. Therefore it is the intention in this bibliography to list all books containing speeches, letters, or anecdotes of any literary interest. I cannot guarantee the authorship of all this material attributed to Twain, but if there is a doubt as to authenticity, I shall endeavor to voice it. Mr. Clemens has set his stamp of approval on such writings as appear in his collected works. The rest is Twainiana, to be put to such tests as any one may be able to apply. It may be stated here, for the benefit of the prospective collector, that his search for definite first editions of Mark Twain is apt to be far more difficult, and therefore far more attractive, than has popularly been supposed. It is true that even the early publication of the Twain books in the first form and first years of printing reached great numbers, but the old-time printers did not run off large editions from duplicate plates on many presses. A single press worked slowly. After a few hundred were printed, the sheets were inspected for errors and changes made in the plates. It may safely be asserted that no first printing by the American Publishing Company ever ran more than a few thousand copies without some change in the text or pictures. Often the change was made after the printing of a very few copies, allowing for loss and mutilation, 
it is certain that almost all definite first editions now exist to the number of only four or five hundred some of them such as tom sawyer and a tramp abroad must be reckoned in tens not hundreds the mechanics of bibliographical presentation for this author's works have been altered slightly from the usual en masse style by the great volume and varied character of his output i have previously mentioned the real literary value of what might in another author be merely fugitive namely speeches letters anecdotes therefore i have divided as justly as possible the lists of books into four divisions first as most important will be given those books and pamphlets of which mr clemens is either author-in-chief or assigned contributor next will be given those containing one or more speeches then those containing letters and lastly as least authentic the anecdotal books as stated before book form for the purposes of this bibliography makes no distinctions as to cloth leather or paper-bound books pamphlets and even a one-sheet publication being included original covers are described wherever possible and in deference to the prevalent taste of collectors the cloth or paper cover is given the preference over the leather in this connection it must be admitted that the description given of the covers and styles of the earlier english editions cannot be complete a residence in england and a study for years of the subject there would be necessary to give all the variations and that has been denied me each separate list is given in chronological order although in deference to a preference for american editions those are described first except where the english editions antedate them more than the usual few days some few canadian editions are given but most of them remain undescribed for reasons previously given i must state here my indebtedness to mr luther livingston the bibliographical expert for personal assistance and the example set by his work i can do no better than adapt here a passage from his bibliography of longfellow the method of which i have followed in great measure page numbers included within parentheses indicate only that pages are unnumbered especially in the case of text pages generally all are numbered excepting only the first whether the first and the last of the series are in parentheses there are often numbered pages between blank pages it will be noticed are with occasionally an exception not mentioned but having at hand a copy of the book described it will be easy to discover whether or not it is perfect and that is the use and end of a collation i may add that the wording of title pages and covers as given here is standardized that is the typographical aspect of the originals is so varied as to the use of caps and lower case that they are repeated here uniformly in lower case capitalizing only the important words if possible blank leaves belonging to signatures at front of books are listed and accounted in implied page numbering but single blank pages are not noted separately periods are sometimes added to finish quotations or collations when those periods do not actually exist in the original text perhaps explanation of the use of parentheses is in order when the words within the parentheses are capitalized the first letters of the main words it indicates that the parentheses and the words exist on the original page when the words within the parentheses are entirely in lower case it indicates that i am describing some feature in my own words as rule or ornament similar distinctions as to the capitalized first letters of words hold good in other cases for instance title contents list of illustrations introductory indicates that title and introductory are my own words used to describe a page not actually so headed and contents and list of illustrations are literally transcribed 
yet after the colon following collation i capitalized the first word without regard to the foregoing rule i am also indebted for assistance to mr james tufts mr peter cadley mrs ralph w ashcroft and many other individuals not to mention almost the entire rare book profession in the united states end of section zero zero introductory Section 1 of Excerpts from a Bibliography of the Work of Mark Twain, Samuel Langhorne Clemens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Books. Bibliography of Mark Twain, 1867 to 1879. 1867. The Celebrated Jumping Frog of Calaveras County and Other Sketches by Mark Twain. Edited by John Paul, New York. C. H. Webb, Publisher. Copyright April 15, 1867. First printing in book form for all items. This book went to press more than once in the year 1867, as authentic first copies differ from later copies on the last 198 page of text, where the letter I in thin is perfect in the first and badly split in the latter. This piece of type persists in imperfect state through the 1868 and 1869 editions. While I list the book as issued in various colored covers, it may be of interest to note that a copy bearing a written date of May 10, 1867, is in the blue cloth, and a confirmation might be drawn from the following extract from chapters from my autobiography, when Artemis Ward passed through California on a lecturing tour in 1865 or 1866, I told him the jumping frog story in San Francisco, and he asked me to write it out and send it to his publisher, Carlton, in New York, to be used in padding out a small book which Artemis had prepared for the press and which needed some more stuffing to make it big enough for the price which was to be charged for it. It reached Carlton in time, but he didn't think much of it, and was not willing to go to the typesetting expense of adding it to the book. He did not put it in the wastebasket, but made Henry Clapp a present of it and Clapp used it to help out the funeral of his dying literary journal, the Saturday Press. The Jumping Frog appeared in the last number of that paper, was the most joyous feature of the obsequies, and was at once copied in the newspapers of America and England. I reported my adventure to Webb, and he bravely said that not all the Carltons in the universe should defeat that book. He would publish it himself on a ten percent royalty. And so he did. He brought it out in blue and gold, and made a very pretty little book of it. I think he named it The Celebrated Jumping Frog of Calaveras County and Other Sketches price one dollar twenty-five cents. He made the plates and printed and bound the book through a job printing house and published it through the American News Company. This book is said to come also in paper cover, but I have never seen such a copy. It has been claimed that the Jumping Frog story was first written by one Samuel Sebow, who printed it in the Stockton, California Independent for December 11, 1858, and that Twain's adaptation appeared in the San Francisco Alta some six or seven years later. Whoever first told that yarn, it is the Twain telling that made it immortal, as in the case of the plays put in lasting form by one Shakespeare Bacon. The English edition of The Jumping Frog was published by Routledge, 1867, during the week ending September 2nd, according to the publisher's circular, nearly four months after the American issue. 1868. 
the public to mark twain this was a dodger one-sheet announcement for mark twain's first lecture in california later reprinted in buyer's manual eighteen seventy two in its entirety with the length entitled the public to mark twain his reply the original measures thirteen and a quarter by five and three quarters eighteen sixty nine the innocents abroad or the pilgrim's progress being some account of the steamship Quaker City's pleasure excursion to Europe and the Holy Land, with descriptions of countries, nations, incidents, and adventures, as they appeared to the author, with 234 illustrations, by Mark Twain, Samuel L. Clemens, issued by subscription only and not for sale in the bookstores. Residents of any state desiring a copy should address the publishers, and an agent will call upon them. Hartford, Connecticut, American Publishing Company. Copyrighted July 28, 1869. Publication date is lacking, which may have been immediate upon copyright, but certainly not later than September 5th, of which date there exist presentation copies. In the first printing, on pages 17 and 18 of Contents, the numerals at the right of the page are missing. They were supplied in later impressions of the same year, as was the word Conclusion, at the foot of page 18. Also, there is no cut on page 129, the large vacancy there being subsequently filled with the portrait of Napoleon III. Chapter XLI, page 643, was later corrected to Chapter LXI. Innocence Abroad was reprinted in England without permission by Houghton in two parts, The Innocence Abroad and The New Pilgrim's Progress. Each volume carries the publisher's lists of 1870 and is listed by the Spectator, May 14, 1870. The two volumes were later made, one under the title Mark Twain's Pleasure Trip on the Continent, also bearing the publisher's lists for 1870. The following from chapters from my autobiography will be of interest here. In June I sailed in the Quaker City excursion. I returned in November, and in Washington found a letter from Elijah Bliss of the American Publishing Company of Hartford offering me 5% royalty on a book which should recount the adventures of the excursion. In lieu of the royalty I was offered the alternative of $10,000 cash upon delivery of the manuscript. I consulted A. D. Richardson, and he said, Take the royalty. I followed his advice and closed with bliss. By my contract, I was to deliver the manuscript in July of 1868. I wrote the book in San Francisco and delivered the manuscript in contract time. Bliss provided a multitude of illustrations for the book and then stopped work on it. The contract date for the issue went by, and there was no explanation of this. At last, toward the end of July, 1869, I think, I lost patience and telegraphed Bliss. Then the canvassing began and went briskly forward. In nine months the book advanced the American Book Company's stock from twenty-five to two hundred, and left seventy thousand dollars profit to the good. The Routledge author's edition of Innocence Abroad follows the Houghton style of issue in two volumes with titles The Innocence Abroad and The New Pilgrim's Progress, but was not published until 1872, if one takes the date of the preface. This preface is the important feature of the books, being specially written for the English authorized edition and divided between the two books. It reads, in part, At the request of Messrs. George Routledge and Sons, I have made a patient and conscientious revision of this book for republication in England, and have weeded out of it, nearly, if not quite, all of the most palpable and inexcusable of its blemishes. At the same time I have wrought into almost every chapter additions which 
cannot fail to augment the attractions of the book or diminish them. It is probable that the patient and conscientious revision referred to above meant merely the alteration of a few passages with a view to more complete copyright protection. I leave it to the more persistent collector to collate the volumes word for word. 1870. The Piccadilly Annual of Entertaining Literature, Retrospective and Contemporary. Mark Twain is represented by Story of the Good Little Boy, page 25, Wit Inspirations of the Two-Year-Olds, page 26, The Late Benjamin Franklin, page 28, Higgins, page 57, Hogwash, A Touching Incident, page 81, All First Printings in Book Form Mainly Taken Without Permission from the Galaxy Magazine. 1871 Mark Twain's Burlesque Autobiography and First Romance. Vignette, New York, Sheldon and Company, under the Grand Central Hotel. The above title in border is on the first page, which is practically the front cover of the copies not bound in cloth. Copyrighted February 10, 1871. Published February 18, 1871. The first edition may be distinguished by the reverse of title, on which page the copyright notice was put at the bottom of the page in later printings, and an advertisement of Ball, Black & Company inserted. To the English unauthorized edition of this book, published by Houghton, is added the story On Children, which Mark Twain disclaimed. This edition carries publishers' lists for 1871, but I cannot give its exact date. The Routledge Authorized Edition is listed by the Publisher's Circular for May 16, 1871. 1871. Mark Twain's Memoranda. From The Galaxy. Monogram. Toronto. C. A. Backus, Publisher. 1871. Memoranda is the great volume of mystery for the Twain collector. Not only is it very rare, but since it is a pirated book, the date of its printing has gone unrecorded, and may never be certified. It contains, with half a dozen exceptions, the series of paragraphs contributed by Mark Twain to the Galaxy magazine in 1870-71, practically the same material with a few more commissions of the Galaxy material, and the edition of the Medieval Romance appears in Screamers and Eye Openers companion volumes published in August 1871 by Houghton in London. None of the three contains the Galaxy contributions for April 1871, and all of them contain articles from February 1871. This is the third and last output of paragraphic material from Twain's pen, the first being in the Pacific Coast newspapers, selected items collected later in The Jumping Frog, 1867. The next output was in the Buffalo Express. These small and hasty effusions did not seem to appeal to their author as proper book material, until the activity of the pirates caused the production of an authorized sketches by Routledge in London. Even then no regular publication was attempted in the United States until 1874-75 in Sketches No. 1 and Sketches New and Old which contain only a selected residuum of this large amount of fugitive material. The Piccadilly Annual, of course, predates Memoranda for its short selection of the Galaxy articles, but there is nothing by which to actually determine, as between Memoranda and the contemporary screamers and eye-openers, yet for convenience sake I place Memoranda before the other two. 1871 eye-openers, good things, immensely funny sayings and stories that will bring a smile upon the gruffest countenance. Vignette by Mark Twain, author of Pleasure Trip on the Continent, The Innocents Abroad, and The New Pilgrim's Progress, The Jumping Frog, Screamers, A Gathering of Delicious Bits, London, John Camden Houghton, All Rights Reserved. First edition, memoranda considered, for journalism in tennessee 1871 screamers a gathering of scraps of humor delicious bits and short stories vignette with script quotation by mark twain 
author of Pleasure Trip on the Continent, The Innocents Abroad and the New Pilgrim's Progress, The Jumping Frog, Eye Openers, A Collection of Good Things, London, John Camden Houghton, All Rights Reserved. First edition, allowing memoranda as first, for holiday literature, Baker's Cat, Soda Water, The Undertaker's Story, A Traveling Show, and About Barbara. Mark Twain disclaims the following stories, Almost Incredible, True Story of Chicago, On Children, Train Up a Child and Away He Goes, and Vengeance, for letter concerning which see Lectures of Bret Hart, 1909. 1872. Nast's Illustrated Almanac, Picture of Merry-Go-Round, 1872, published by Harper and Brothers, New York. This is the first American appearance, that article having been previously published in the Piccadilly Annual in England. Copyrighted September 8, 1871. Published October 10, 1871. 1872. Roughing It by Mark Twain, Samuel L. Clemens. Fully illustrated by eminent artists. Issued by subscription only and not for sale in bookstores. Residents of any state desiring a copy should address the publishers as below. Rule, Hartford, Connecticut, American Publishing Company. Copyrighted December 6, 1871. Copy filed in Washington February 19, 1872. In later impressions of this book, the capital M in first line of contents, page 11, and the letter Y in the word my, first word of chapter 1, page 19, are broken, while in the first impressions they are perfect. 1872. Roughing It by Mark Twain, Samuel L. Clemens, author of the celebrated Jumping Frog, copyright edition, London, George Routledge and Sons. Listed by The Spectator for the week ending February 10, 1872. 1872. The Innocents at Home by Mark Twain, author of The Celebrated Jumping Frog, copyright edition, London, George Routledge and Sons. Published February 10, 1872. This is the second half of the work entitled Roughing It, as published in the United States, and this English publication seems to antedate the American issue by about a week. 1872. A Curious Dream and Other Sketches by Mark Twain. Selected and revised by the author. Copyright London, George Routledge and Sons. First edition for all items except Facts in the Case of George Fisher, Deceased. 1872. Mark Twain's Sketches. Selected and revised by the author. Copyright edition London, George Routledge and Sons. Listed in the Spectator for the week ending June 1, 1872. First printing in book form for Author's Advertisement, Prefatory, and Cannibalism in the Cars. 1872. Practical Jokes with Artemis Ward, including the story of The Man Who Fought Cats, Vignette, by Mark Twain and other humorists. London, John Camden Houghton. All rights reserved. Listed in Spectator for week ending August 24, 1872. The other humorists line on the title page makes this a puzzler. Most of the contents are authentically Mark Twain, but personally I should question the following. Dr. Mulgrub's Bitters, Call a Man, A Melting Story, Buying a Corner Lot, The Unsophisticated Infant, Just One More, and The Man Who Fought Cats, A Goke by Artemis Ward, and Artemis Ward, are not by Twain. The book is first printing for all items except How Mark Twain Was Sold in Newark, Mark Twain's Remarkable Stranger, To Raise Poultry, Mark Twain's California Experience, Mark Twain's Disgraceful Persecution of a Boy, and Mark Twain's Tone Imparting Committee. Introduction and Mark Twain and the Highwaymen are anecdotes only. 1872, The Buyer's Manual and Business Guide, being a description of the leading business houses, manufactories, inventions, etc., of the Pacific Coast, together with copious and readable selections, chiefly from California writers, compiled by J. Price and C. S. Haley. 
San Francisco, Francis and Valentine, Steam Book and Job Printing Establishment, 1872. This not being a registered book, it may or may not have been issued before Practical Jokes. If first published, it is the first edition for Mark Twain's first interview with Artemis Ward. If later issued, it is first American edition of the story named, as for entertaining history of the scriptural panoramist. The public to Mark Twain, his reply, was first printed as a dodger for the lecture therein advertised. 1873. Tom Hood's Comic Annual for 1873, with 23 pages of illustration by the brothers Dalziel, London, published at the Fun Office. How I Escaped Being Killed in a Duel, by Mark Twain, pages 90-91. 1873. A Book for an Hour, containing choice reading and character sketches, A Curious Dream, and other sketches, revised and selected for this work by the author Mark Twain. First edition for A Self-Made Man, and first American edition for all other items. Copyrighted April 15, 1873, filed in Washington May 26, 1873. 1873, Nast's Illustrated Almanac, Picture of Merry-Go-Round, published by Harper & Brothers, New York. Contains the story of the good little boy who did not prosper. This is the first American appearance of that story, it having previously been printed in the Piccadilly Annual in England. Copyrighted October 2, 1872. Published October 11, 1872. 1873. The Choice Humorous Works of Mark Twain, now first collected, with extra passages to The Innocents Abroad, now first reprinted, and A Life of the Author, illustrations by Mark Twain and other artists, also portrait of the author. London, John Camden Houghton. This seems to be the first printing in book form for Information Wanted, How I Secured a Birth, and Mark Twain as George Washington. 1873, 100 Choice Selections, number 6, uniform with the series, being a repository of literary gems, eloquent, pathetic, serious, and amusing, adapted to the use of lyceums, temperance societies, public readers, exhibition rooms, anniversaries, family firesides, schools, etc., etc., compiled and arranged by Phineas Garrett, author of 100 Choice Selections, Numbers 2, 3, 4, and 5, and Excelsior Dialogues, published by P. Garrett and Company. Contains in pages 118 to 120, Mark Twain on Juvenile Pugilists. I have not seen this elsewhere, but it is in Twain's earlier manner, apparently. 1874, Nast's Illustrated Almanac, Picture of Merry-Go-Round, published by Harper and Brothers. Contains a deception, pages 30-31. This is the first American appearance of that story, it having a previous appearance in A Curious Dream in England. The article was later headed How the Author Was Sold in Newark. Copyrighted September 18, 1873. Published October 11, 1873. 1873-74. The Gilded Age, a tale of today by Mark Twain, Samuel L. Clemens, author of Innocence Abroad, Roughing It, etc., and Charles Dudley Warner, author of My Summer in a Garden, Backlog Studies, etc., sold by subscription only. Hartford, American Publishing Company, 1874. Other title pages printed in the same form at the same time bear name of another firm under American Publishing Company and are dated 1873. The original sheets were bound up with these various title pages and published in December 1873. Copyrighted April 23, 1873. Copy filed in Washington January 6, 1874. However, I have a copy with presentation inscription of December 24, 1873, and the American Publishing Company books show the actual publication some days before that time. Much confusion has been injected into the first edition question on this book by the existence of a title page bearing American Publishing Company, 1873. 
it is almost certain that this was printed separately by a firm desiring to evade subscription restrictions and substituted for the original page it lacks the name of one of the illustrators white and on the reverse the electrotyper is omitted and is in different face type from other printings mr bliss of the american publishing company certifies that no such fonts of type were in the possession of his company added certainty is given to the restriction evading theory by the fact that numerous other copies exist with a rectangular slit at the bottom of the page where a firm name has been cut out to enable them to sell at a reduction to the trade without detection the real test of the first edition of the gilded age may be found on page four hundred and three no illustration is to be found there in the first printing yet philip leaving laura tail piece is called for by the list of illustrations this cut was afterwards supplied even in some copies dated eighteen seventy three later copies generally have two leaves of publishers lists after text an entry on the publishers books shows that the first sixty copies from the bindery were sent out stitched without covers for review the copy for the boston transcript shows on the title page american publishing company eighteen seventy four and lacks cut page four o three i have seen no correct copy in eighteen seventy four bearing more than one firm name on title all copies seen in eighteen seventy three have more than one firm name the name eschol sellers for one of the principal characters of the book runs through more than one edition on the protest of an actual owner of the name it was changed to beriah sellers but as stated above this has no bearing on the actual first printing i have not been able to secure the english edition or to determine its date the english catalogue lists it as three volumes eighteen seventy three seventy four possibly that means that the three volumes were not issued together it is listed in the publisher's circular for june sixteenth eighteen seventy four from the evening mail may fifth nineteen ten how mark twain and charles dudley warner came to write the gilded age by e j edwards the late stephen a hubbard who was for many years the managing editor and one of the owners of the hartford connecticut current when joseph r hawley was editor and charles dudley warner the author and humorist co-editor told me this the real story of the manner in which mark twain and mr warner came to write the gilded age which was published in eighteen seventy three after mark twain came to hartford to live said mr hubbard he early made the acquaintance of mr warner being especially attracted to him because of the success of the deliciously humorous book my summer garden which gained mr warner national fame and which was the first of his separate writings the acquaintance ripened into intimacy and the families of the two men were frequently together it happened that one evening when the twains had the warners at a family dinner something was said about the success of innocence abroad thereupon both mrs clemens and mrs warner began to twit mark twain they made all manner of good-natured fun of his book called it an accidental hit and finally ended up by defying him to write another work like it in high good humor mark twain turned to mr warner you and i will show these ladies that their laughter is unseemly and a cracking of thorns under a pot he cried we'll get together and write a story chapter by chapter every morning and we will so interweave our work that these wives of ours will not be able to say which part has been written by mark twain and which by charles d warner for once a week we will gather in my library and read the story to them as it has progressed under our pens what was spoken in jest was acted upon in the spirit of jest 
Mr. Warner agreeing to meet Mark Twain every morning for an hour or two so that together they could write a new story somewhat on the lines of Innocence Abroad. After they had been at work on their little joke for a little while, they became thoroughly interested in it, and then Mark Twain proposed to introduce the character of Colonel Sellers in the story. Both he and Mr. Warner grew actually enthusiastic over it, and their wives confessed their deep interest in it as it was read to them as the writing progressed. So the jest was carried on until the story was about half finished, if I remember correctly, when it suddenly occurred to Mark Twain that it might be worth publishing. If it interested the wives of the authors, it ought to interest the public. Therefore Twain approached his publishers and told them that he and Mr. Warner were jointly writing a book, and he wondered whether he could make arrangements with them to publish it. They jumped at the proposition. The book was published under the title of The Gilded Age. It sold beyond all expectation for a while, and then suddenly the sales dropped. The book returned some profit to the joint authors and the publishers. Copyright 1910 by E. J. Edwards. Later on the book was dramatized with Raymond Hitchcock in the title role. The play was a great success for a number of years until Mr. Hitchcock withdrew, owing to a difference of opinion between him and Mr. Clemens. After that it failed to attract the public. Another interesting point concerning the Gilded Age is with reference to the mottos in various languages used as chapter headings. They were furnished by James Hammond Trumbull, librarian of the Wadsworth Library in Hartford, Connecticut, and the translations may be found in the American Publishing Company's uniform edition of the book. 1874. Number 1. Mark Twain's Vignette. Sketches. Authorized edition with illustrations by R. T. Sperry, American News Company. Copyrighted May 9, 1874. Copy filed in Washington, June 4, 1874. First edition for A Memorable Midnight Experience, Rogers, and first American edition for most of the other stories. The first issue shows a clean last page of cover. An Aetna life insurance advertisement dated 1877 on that cover denotes a later issue. 1875. Lotus Leaves. Original stories, essays, and poems by various authors, including Mark Twain. Edited by John Broham and John Elderkin. Illustrated. Boston William F. Gill and Company. Copyrighted December 12, 1874. Copy filed in Washington, January 22, 1875. Mark Twain contributes an encounter with an interviewer, pages 27 to 32. 1875. Mark Twain's sketches, new and old, now first published in complete form, sold only by subscription, the American Publishing Company, Hartford. Published July 21, 1875. The first printing is marked by the paragraph From Hospital Days, page 299. An erratum slip was pasted in at that page, which reads, by an error of the publishers the above sketch from hospital days was inserted in this book it should not have been as mark twain is not the author of it it will not appear in any future edition curiously enough the copy for this skit exists entirely in the writing of mr clemens and the crossing out by him of the name thereon of jane stuart woolsey in sending it to the printer, does not entirely set at rest the suspicion that Samuel, and not any Jane, was the guilty person. Perhaps Mr. Clemens really intended it to go in, and it was an officious printer who took it out on his own responsibility. The first issue also has a duplicated note, pages 119 and 120. 1876. Old Times on the Mississippi by Mark Twain author of Innocents Abroad, Roughing It, etc., etc. Toronto, Belford Brothers, Publishers, 1876. First printing in book form for Old Times on the Mississippi and A Literary Nightmare. Old Times on the Mississippi was later incorporated in Life on the Mississippi, 1883, and A Literary Nightmare was reprinted under the title Punch Brothers Punch, 1878. Old Times on the Mississippi was also printed in England, 
and it is barely possible that it preceded the Canadian issue. I cannot give the English date. Later issues in the same year of the Canadian book contain mention of Tom Sawyer on the title page as one of the author's works, as well as an ad of same book on reverse of half-title. 1876. Information Wanted and Other Sketches by Mark Twain. Two-line authorization signed. London, George Routledge and Sons. I cannot give the exact date of publication, but I have seen a presentation copy dated June 4, 1876. 1876. The Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain. London, Chatto and Windus, Piccadilly, All Rights Reserved. Published June 9, 1876, over six months before the American issue. It is claimed that a certain Canadian pirated edition, set up from proof sheets stolen day by day by a printer at the American Publishing Company, was the first issue, but it could hardly be previous to this English edition. 1876. History of the Big Bonanza, an authentic account of the discovery, history, and working of the world-renowned Comstock Silver Lode of Nevada, including the present condition of the various mines situated thereon sketches of the most prominent men interested in them, incidents and adventures connected with mining, the Indians, and the country, amusing stories, experiences, anecdotes, etc., etc., and a full exposition of the production of pure silver by Dan de Quill. Sold by subscription only, Hartford, Connecticut, American Publishing Company. Copyrighted July 12, 1876, Copy filed in Washington, September 20, 1876. One page introductory is by Mark Twain. This book is very desirable to the admirer of Twain, as it was written by a fellow worker on the Virginia City Enterprise of Nevada, who figured as one of the characters of Roughing It, and is a most readable supplement and commentary on same. 1876. The Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain the American Publishing Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Tom Sawyer was first printed on a good-quality calendared paper and changed during the same year to much heavier, cheaper paper. In the first issue there are two blank, unnumbered pages, one before and one after the preface. This latter feature, however, was repeated in some issues in later years. Early in the first year, an indent or gouge was made in the bottom line on the first page of text, which persists through all later imprints from the same plates. 1877, Volume 3, Whole Number, 10, The Quarterly Elocutionist, Readings, Recitations, Declamations, and Dialogues for School, Parlor, and Platform, edited and published by Mrs. Anna Randall Deal, a hundred and forty-eight pages of text with Mark Twain's Literary Nightmare, pages 130 to 136. This is the first American printing in book form, allowing this to be a book, of this story, later entitled Punch Brothers Punch. The poem around which the sketch was written was issued as a song set to music, 1876. Did Mark Twain write the poem? 1877. A True Story, and The Recent Carnival of Crime, by Mark Twain. Boston, James R. Osgood and Company. Copyrighted September 17, 1877. Copy filed in Washington September 19, 1877. 1878. Punch Brothers Punch, and Other Sketches, by Mark Twain. New York, Sloat, Woodman and Company. First edition for Random Notes of an Idle Excursion, Speech at a Dinner of the Knights of St. Patrick, The Loves of Alonzo Fitz Clarence, and The Canvasser's Tale. Copyrighted and filed in Washington, March 14, 1878. The English edition was published by Chatto and Windus under the title An Idle Excursion, listed by Spectator for the week ending March 30, 1878. Another firm published Mark Twain's Nightmare, and in Scotland appeared Punch Brothers Punch. Canada contributed during the same period An Idle Excursion and Rambling Notes of an Idle Excursion. One of them may have been issued previous to the American publication, but as most of them were pirated, there is little hope of obtaining the exact dates except by accident. 1879. One Hundred Choice Selections. 
a rare collection of oratory, sentiment, eloquence, and humor, for public readings, winter gatherings, social entertainments, elocutionary exercises, temperance societies, exhibitions, lyceums, etc., designed to accompany the preceding numbers, published by P. Garrett & Company, Philadelphia, P.A. Above title was not taken from the first printing, so I do not attempt to collate fully. It contains pages 172 to 174, Jim Wolfe and the Cats. The story is undoubtedly Twain's, but the phrasing and spelling indicate a probability of its being a lecture report and not a direct contribution. In one of the chapters from my autobiography, Mark Twain states that during his stay in England, about 1873, the story entitled Jim Wolfe and the Cats was sold without warrant to Tom Hood by a certain young man. How I Escaped Being Killed in a Duel appeared in Tom Hood's annual for 1873, but I have not seen the issues for the ensuing years. End of section 1. Books 1867 to 1879. Section 2 of Excerpts from a Bibliography of the Work of Mark Twain, Samuel Langhorne Clemens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Books, 1880 to 1889. A Tramp Abroad. Illustrated by W. F. R. Brown, True Williams, B. Day, and other artists, with also three or four pictures made by the author of this book, without outside help. In all, 328 illustrations by Mark Twain, Samuel L. Clemens, sold by subscription only, Hartford, Connecticut, American Publishing Company, published March 13, 1880. The engraved frontispiece of Mark Twain in this book showed spots during its first printing. It was therefore re-engraved for further use. The original plate shows the fine underlying lines vertical, while on the remade plate they are oblique. The caption for the pictorial frontispiece was originally Moses, and later changed to Titian's Moses. 1880, A Tramp Abroad by Mark Twain, author of The Innocents Abroad, The New Pilgrim's Progress, etc. In two volumes, Volume 1, Volume 2, London, Chatto and Windus, All Rights Reserved. 1882, The Prince and the Pauper, A Tale for Young People of All Ages by Mark Twain, with 192 illustrations. Boston, James R. Osgood & Company. This collation is of the regularly published edition. There was a specially printed number, variously stated to be from 6 to 20, on China or India paper for Mr. Clemens personally, a copy of which I have not had opportunity to inspect. Copyrighted October 13, 1881, filed in Washington December 12, 1881. 1881. The Prince and the Pauper, A Tale for Young People of All Ages by Mark Twain, Samuel L. Clemens, with 190 illustrations. London, Chatto and Windus, All Rights Reserved. Published December 1, 1881, almost two weeks before the American issue. 1882. The Stolen White Elephant, etc., by Mark Twain. Publisher's Seal, Boston, James R. Osgood & Company. Copyrighted April 29, 1882. Copies filed at Washington June 12, 1882. 1882. The Stolen White Elephant, etc., by Mark Twain, Samuel L. Clemens. London, Chateau, and Windus, all rights reserved. Contents identical with American edition. Published June 10, 1882, a day or so previous to the American issue. 1882. Date 1601 conversation as it was by the social fireside in the time of the tudors imprint page eleven reads done at ye academy press m d c c c l x x x i i this has been privately printed in small editions several times but the copy described above is presumably the first edition as it came direct from stormfield to me it is, however, just possible that some borrower of the original manuscript may have surreptitiously put it in type before 1882. Witness the following extracts from letters from John Hay to one Gunn 
of Cleveland, dated in 1880. Here it is. It was written by Mark Twain in a serious effort to bring back our literature and philosophy to the sober and chaste Elizabethan standard. The proposition which you make to pull a few proofs of the masterpiece is highly attractive, and, of course, highly immoral. I cannot properly consent to it, and I am afraid the great man would think I was taking an unfair advantage of his confidence. Please send back the document as soon as you can, and if in spite of my prohibition you take these proofs, save me one. The italics are mine. 1883. Life on the Mississippi by Mark Twain. With more than three hundred illustrations, sold by subscription only, Boston, James R. Osgood & Company. Copyrighted January 18, 1883. Copy filed in Washington, May 17, 1883. The first copies contained a plate, page 441, showing Mark Twain in flames, which was omitted at the request of Mrs. Clemens in further printings of same title-page date. 1883. Life on the Mississippi by Mark Twain, with over three hundred illustrations, London, Chatto and Windus, all rights reserved. Published May 12, 1883, some days before the American issue. 1883. The New Guide of the Conversation in Portuguese and English in Two Parts by Pedro Carolino, first American edition, reprinted verbatim et literatum, with an introduction by Mark Twain. Boston, James R. Osgood and Company. The only copy printed in England I have seen was issued by Routledge and bore the date of 1884. Two articles, captioned Portuguese-English, appeared in the Californian magazine in 1864, commenting upon this same work by Pedro Carolino, José de Fonseca. The comments give no evidence of having been written by Mark Twain, but it is highly probable that in his capacity as assistant editor of the magazine he obtained the book and was moved to write his later effusion. 1885. Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, Tom Sawyer's Comrade seen the mississippi valley time forty to fifty years ago by mark twain with one hundred and seventy four illustrations new york charles l webster and company an edition of thirty thousand was printed and a number of copies for agents were bound up when the illustration on page two hundred and eighty three disclosed a defect of such nature that it became necessary to correct the plate and substitute a new sheet for that page the copies in the agent's hands were recalled as far as possible and destroyed. However, it is said that a few of the original copies still exist. 1884. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, Tom Sawyer's Comrade, seen the Mississippi Valley, time forty to fifty years ago, by Mark Twain, Samuel L. Clemens, with 174 illustrations, London, Chatto and Windus, all rights reserved. Published December 10, 1884, three days before an American copy was received at Washington. 1885. Funny Fellows. Funniest book of all. My copy lacks the title page, so I cannot give much correct information about the book. It was published by Rhodes and McClure, Chicago, April 7, 1885. The Mark Twain items are Mr. Beecher's Farm, pages I to I, 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 and Mark Twain's Remarkable Gold Mines, page 6. The first item appeared in Curious Dream, London, 1872, but the latter I have not found elsewhere. 1887. English, as she is taught, being genuine answers to examination questions in our public schools, collected by Carolyn B. Leroux, with a commentary thereon by Mark Twain. London, T. Fisher Unwin. The American book published under the same title in 1887 has Castle and Company's imprint and carries only the five-line quotation from Mark Twain referred to above. The entire Mark Twain article was first published in book form in the United States in 1900, but without the Leroux compilation. 1888. Mark Twain's Library of Humor. Illustrated by E. W. Kemble. New York, Charles L. Webster and Company. 
This book consists entirely of reprints from previous books, with the exception of the Compiler's Apology, page V, and Warm Hair, page 7. This latter paragraph is attributed to Mark Twain in the first printing, but the author's name was later omitted from the page. First editions of 1888 had the table of contents in page numerical order, later corrected to alphabetical order. A slightly darker cloth was also used in the binding of later issues. Under the same general title, Harper's issued in 1906 Men and Things, Women and Things, The Primrose Way, and A Little Nonsense, all being equally barren of first edition material, for Mark Twain at least. 1889 a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court by Mark Twain, New York, Charles L. Webster and Company. Copyrighted August 7, 1889. Copy filed in Washington December 5, 1889. The English edition, issued by Chatto and Windus, and published December 6, 1889. End of section 2. Books, 1880-1889. Section 3 of Excerpts from a Bibliography of the Work of Mark Twain, Samuel Langhorne Clemens, by Merle Johnson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Books, 1890-1899. Charles Dickens, by pen and pencil, including anecdotes and reminiscences collected from his friends and contemporaries, by Frederick G. Kitten. London, Frank T. Sabin. M. D. C. 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 X. C. Folio in paper-covered parts contains on pages 157 to 158 a fine letter contributed by Twain, evidently written for publication, therefore here listed, and not among letters. 1892. Merry Tales by Mark Twain. New York. Charles L. Webster and Company. Copyrighted February 23, 1892 filed in Washington, March 28, 1892. This book was first bound up with figured end papers. Subsequently, plain end papers were used, and a portrait frontispiece of Mark Twain added. 1892. Mark Twain, His Life and Work, a biographical sketch by William M. Clemens, the Clemens Publishing Company, San Francisco. This material was run in twelve parts in the Library and Studio, from June 1891 to June 1892. The book was published May 25, 1892, the first issue being less than 1,000 copies. It contains many Mark Twain letters, speeches, anecdotes, and other literary and personal items. Until the authorized Life by Albert Bigelow Payne is published, it will remain the most complete presentation for the period it purports to cover. 1892. The American Claimant by Mark Twain, New York, Charles L. Webster and Company. Published in various newspapers by the McClure Syndicate, and also appeared as a serial in the Idler magazine in twelve numbers from January 1892 to January 1893. Copyrighted in 1891 and 1892 for the newspaper and magazine appearances, but no record in Washington for the book publication. The absence of data in the Library of Congress at Washington concerning the date of publication in America prevents determining priority of issue. 1893. The One Million Pound Banknote and Other New Stories by Mark Twain. New York, Charles L. Webster and Company. Copyrighted and published February 25, 1893. The English edition, issued by Chatto and Windus. I cannot give the exact date of issue beyond the fact that the book was reviewed in The Spectator in the week ending June 24, 1893, and the book itself carries publishers' lists for March 1893. 1893. The Niagara Book, a complete souvenir of Niagara Falls, containing sketches, stories, and essays, descriptive, humorous, historical, and scientific. Written exclusively for this book by W. D. Howells, Mark Twain, and others. Buffalo, Underhill and Nichols. Published June 27, 1893. The fourth story in the table of contents is given The First Authentic Mention of Niagara Falls by Mark Twain, page 93. 
Turning to page 93, there is a drawn heading, The Earliest Authentic Mention of Niagara Falls, extracts from Adam's Diary, translated from the original manuscript by Mark Twain, page 93 to 109. 1893, Pudd'nhead Wilson's Calendar for 1894. This book was distributed to both old and prospective subscribers of the Century magazine just before the commencement of the new volume, November 1893. This would place the date of publication about September 1893. The calendar later appeared as chapter headings in the periodical and book publication of Pudd'nhead. 1893, the first book of the Authors' Club. Liber Scriptorum, two-line quotation with credit, New York, published by the Authors' Club, M.D.C.C.C. X.C.I.I.I. Copyrighted October 31, 1893, probably published same date. The Californian's Tale by Samuel L. Clemens occupies pages 154 to 161. Mark Twain was one of 104 contributors every article in every copy of the book being signed by its author in ink. There were originally 251 copies of the book, but over 30 were split up into their component articles, and so destroyed. 1894. Tom Sawyer Abroad, by Huck Finn, edited by Mark Twain, with illustrations by Dan Beard. New York, Charles L. Webster and Company. Copyrighted January 25, 1894, and copy filed in Washington, April 18, 1894. Ran as a serial in St. Nicholas, November 1893 to April 1894. 1894, Tom Sawyer Abroad by Mark Twain, Samuel L. Clemens. London, Chatto and Windus. This book was announced by Chatto and Windus on April 16, 1894, I can find no confirmation for the actual issue, but if the publishers kept their word, the book appeared two days before the filing of an American copy in Washington. 1894. The Tragedy of Pudd'nhead Wilson and the Comedy, Those Extraordinary Twins, by Mark Twain. Hartford, American Publishing Company. Copyrighted November 10, 1894. Published November 28th and filed in Washington November 30th, 1894. Pudd'nhead Wilson appeared as a serial in the Century magazine from December 1893 to June 1894. That publication did not include those extraordinary twins. 1894. Pudd'nhead Wilson, a tale by Mark Twain. London, Chatto and Windus. Listed by the Spectator for the week ending November 24, 1894, at least four days before the American issue. 1896. Personal Recollections of Joan of Arc. By the Sieur Louis de Comte, her page and secretary. Freely translated, out of the ancient French into modern English, from the original unpublished manuscript in the National Archives of France. By Jean-Francois Aldan. New York. Harper and Brothers Publishers. Copyrighted March 18, 1896. Copy filed in Washington May 1, 1896. The English edition was published May 1st, simultaneously with the American issue. Issued by Chatto and Windus, and carries publisher's list dated March 1896. 1896. Tom Sawyer Abroad. Tom Sawyer, Detective, and Other Stories, etc., etc., by Mark Twain. New York, Harper and Brothers Publishers. Copyrighted August 25, 1896. Published November 17, 1896. First edition for Tom Sawyer Detective. 1897, Tom Sawyer Detective, as told by Huck Finn, and other tales by Mark Twain, S. L. Clemens. London, Chatto and Windus. Published December 8, 1896. 1897, How to Tell a Story and other essays by Mark Twain. New York, Harper and Brothers, Publishers. Copyrighted March 8, 1897. Harper date of publication March 9, 1897. Copy filed in Washington April 9, 1897. 1897. Following the Equator. A Journey Around the World by Mark Twain, Samuel L. Clemens. Hartford, Connecticut, The American Publishing Company, 
M D C C C X C V I I. Copyrighted September tenth, eighteen ninety seven. Copy filed in Washington, November thirteenth, eighteen ninety seven. Only one printing was made of the large illustrated edition, but two hundred and fifty sets of sheets, first from the press, were set aside. The number of copies were then bound up with a title page bearing the imprint of the American Publishing Company. The remainder were put out with the combined imprint of the American Publishing Company and the Doubleday and McClure Company. Finally, a few copies were bound up of the original 250 sheets above mentioned, signed by Mark Twain, and issued as a large paper edition, Deluxe. The full number of copies were not bound up for sale because of fancied conflict with the projected autograph edition of the collected works. This limited edition was bound up later than the initial marketing of the other two imprints, a very mixed procedure. 1897. More Tramps Abroad by Mark Twain. London, Chatto and Windus. Published November 12, 1897, one day before the filing of the American issue under the title Following the Equator in Washington. It is probable, however, that the publication of the two books was simultaneous, the extra day for the American book being lost in the mails from Hartford to Washington. 1897. Sixty and Six Chips from Literary Workshops edited by Will M. Clemens, author of The Life of Mark Twain, etc. New Amsterdam Book Company, New York. Contains, as Article 52, the book being unpaged, The Panama Railroad, by Mark Twain. This is a small portion of an article once contributed to a Chicago newspaper. 1897. Queen Victoria's Jubilee. The Great Procession of June 22, 1897, in the Queen's Honor, reported both in the light of history and as a spectacle by Mark Twain, privately printed for private distribution only. Originally contributed to the New York Journal, June 21st and 23rd, 1897. Date of issue of the book is uncertain, but at least previous to 1908. Edition limited to 195 copies. End of Section 3. Books. 1890 to 1899. Section 4 of Excerpts from a Bibliography of the Work of Mark Twain, Samuel Langhorne Clemens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 1900. How to Tell a Story and Other Essays by Mark Twain, Samuel L. Clemens. Hartford, Connecticut, The American Publishing Company. Copyrighted April 9, 1900. Filed in Washington May 11, 1900. The last article was not written by Mr. Clemens. The five preceding articles are first appearances in book form. The same plates were used in printing several editions, but the book collated above, in the autograph limited edition, went first to press. 1900. The Man That Corrupted Hadleyburg and Other Stories and Essays by Mark Twain. Harper & Brothers Publishers, New York and London. Copyrighted April 30, 1900. Published June 11, 1900. The publishers of this book changed the quality of the paper from heavy to light while still running off sheets bearing the 1900 date. The earlier issues may be told by the greater thickness of the volume, the gilt letter title on the back having free space in the first case, and in the later style reaching clear to the sides. The English edition of Hadleyburg is duodecimo, orange cloth, 414 pages of text issued by Chatto and Windus. I have not the exact date of publication, but it bears the ads of June 1900, and was presumably simultaneous with the American issue. 1900, The Man That Corrupted Hadleyburg and Other Stories and Sketches by Mark Twain, copyright edition, in two volumes, Leipzig, Bernard Tauschnitz, first printing in book form for Christian Science and the Book of Mrs. Eddy, and Diplomatic Pay and Clothes. 1900, Eccentricities of Genius, Memories of Famous Men and Women of the Platform and Stage, by Major J. B. Pond, G. W. Dillingham Company, Publishers, New York. 
Mark Twain's lecture tour across the continent under management of Pond is detailed, pages 197 to 233, including many Mark Twain letters and anecdotes. That journey was the one undertaken to clear off the Webster debts, and was continued on around the world, as related in Following the Equator, 1897. Two speeches are given, introducing Nye and Riley, pages 247-249, and introducing Henry M. Stanley, pages 265-267. to 1900. English as She is Taught, by Mark Twain, with biographical sketch of author by Matthew Irving Lands. Mutual Book Company, Boston, Massachusetts. This material was first printed in book form in London, 1887. Therefore, this 1900 publication is first American issue only. It contains none of the Leroux compilation. 1901. To the Person Sitting in Darkness, by Mark Twain, reprinted by permission from the North American Review, February 1901. If, as claimed by the Secretary of the Anti-Imperialist League, 125,000 of this pamphlet were distributed during the campaign of 1901 as political propaganda, there must have been more than one printing of the item. It is now so scarce that I can give no hint of any distinctions. Dan Beard, illustrator of A Yankee in King Arthur's Court, tells of meeting Mr. Clemens on the street, said the author, by the way, I have just written something that you'll like. It is called To the Person Sitting in Darkness. I read it to Howells, and Howells said I ought to have that published. Howells also said that I must go hang myself first, and when I asked him what I should do that for, he said to save the public the trouble, because when that story appeared in print, they would surely hang me. Iconoclastic as the article referred to may have been, Mr. Clemens lived to meet his end peacefully at home. Holding back was not Mr. Clemens' forte. 1901. Edmund Burke on Crocker and Tammany by Mark Twain, a member of the Order of Acorns. This article delivered as an address before the Organization Committee of the Acorns at the Waldorf Astoria, Thursday evening, October 17th, was originally prepared for the North American Review. Colonel G. B. M. Harvey, publisher of the Review, seeing its great force, agreed that the article should first appear as an address, in order that it reach the citizens of New York before the publication of the November issue of the North American Review. 1902, a double-barreled detective story by Mark Twain, author of Huckleberry Finn, Life on the Mississippi, A Yankee in King Arthur's Court, etc., illustrated by Lucius Hitchcock. New York and London, Harper and Brothers, Publishers, M.C.M.I.I. Copyrighted February 21, 1902. Published by Harper's April 8, 1902. Filed in Washington April 10, 1902. The English edition is issued by Chatto and Windus, and bears the publisher's lists for March 1902. I cannot give the date of publication, but it was probably simultaneous with the American issue. 1902. A Double-Barreled Detective Story, etc., by Mark Twain. Copyright edition, Leipzig, Bernard Tauschnitz. First printing in book form for all but the title story, and only printing in book form for a defense of General Funston. 1903. My debut as a literary person, with other essays and stories, by Mark Twain, Samuel L. Clemens. Hartford, Connecticut, The American Publishing Company, 1903. Filed in Washington, April 28, 1903. First appearance in book form for The Belated Russian Passport, and first American edition for Two Little Tales, Diplomatic Pay and Clothes, and the Death Disc. The three latter stories had previously appeared in Hadleyburg, Tauschnitz, and Double Barrel Detective Story, Tauschnitz. 1903. Masterpieces of Wit and Humor with Stories and an Introduction by Robert J. Burdett, the world renowned preacher humorist. 
containing all that is best in the literature of laughter of all nations. Contains two Mark Twain sketches, New Ideas on Farming, pages 55 to 56, and Did Not Hurt the Mule, pages 412 to 413. These I have not seen in magazine or newspaper, and while, of course, Mark Twain did not contribute directly to this book, both articles seem authentic as resembling his early work. This bears date 1902 on the title page as given above, but no record is had of it in Washington before October 1903. 1903. The Jumping Frog in English, then in French, then clawed back into a civilized language once more by patient, unremunerated toil by Mark Twain. New York and London, Harper and Brothers Publishers, M.C.M.I.I.I. This book contains the original Jumping Frog story with all of its later addenda, but is the first printing for Note, pages 64 to 66, published November 18, 1903. 1903. A Dog's Tale, reprinted by permission from Harper's Magazine, Christmas number, 1903, by Mark Twain, printed for the National Anti-Vivisection Society. This story originally appeared in Harper's Magazine for December 1893. The edition described above was printed from the magazine type, with the omission of the page numbers, and limited to less than fifty copies, the exact number being in doubt. On the rear cover is printed a list of officers of the National Anti-Vivisection Society, apparently all of Great Britain, and it is understood that practically this entire edition was distributed among the officials so mentioned, possibly with the object of obtaining letters for use in advertising the trade edition. It is probable that this small edition was printed soon after the appearance of the story in magazine form and before the close of 1903. The book was published September 15, 1904. The English edition is identical with the exception of London and New York on title and printed in the United States on copyright page, and it was presumably issued simultaneously. 1904. Extracts from Adam's Diary, translated from the original manuscript by Mark Twain. New York and London, Harper and Brothers, Publishers, MCMIV. Published April 6, 1904, and is first edition for the following note, I translated a portion of this diary some years ago, and a friend of mine printed a few copies in an incomplete form, but the public never got them. Since then I have deciphered some more of Adam's hieroglyphics, and think he has now become sufficiently important as a public character to justify this publication. M.T. Otherwise the text is the same line for line as the story contributed to the Niagara book, 1893, without additions, and with the omission of about three lines, pages 97-98, Niagara book, and the Niagara book was certainly public property. 1905 King Leopold's Soliloquy, A Defense of His Congo Rule by Mark Twain, The P. R. Warren Company, Boston, Massachusetts. Copyrighted and published September 28, 1905. The second issue may be determined by the change of cover tint to black from green. The issue with second edition, in reality the third printing, is first printing for supplementary, pages 45-46. 1906. Their Husbands' Wives, Harper's Novelettes, edited by William Dean Howells and Henry Mills Alden. Harper and Brothers, Publishers, New York and London. Published March 15, 1906. This antedates by four months the separate illustrated edition of Eve's Diary. 1906. What is Man? New York. Printed at the Divini Press. Published August 20, 1906. Published anonymously and limited to 250 numbered copies. A book with serious intent containing Mark Twain's philosophy of life. According to its preface, studies for the book were begun as far back as 1880, and it was actually written in 1898. Copies were distributed to personal friends only, 
and public acknowledgment of his authorship was withheld until after his death, while fear of being misunderstood deterred him from publicly publishing his views in 1906. In 1910 the faith that was in him was so strong that an article in Harper's Bazaar for February 1910, The Turning Point of My Life, contains an almost complete exposition of that same philosophy. 1906, The $30,000 Bequest and Other Stories by Mark Twain. New York and London, Harper & Brothers Publishers. English edition, same sheets, simultaneously issued, with stamp at foot of copyright page, printed in U.S. of America. 1906, A Horse's Tale. As was the case with The Dog's Tale, a few copies of this story were first printed from the magazine type, bound in wrappers and privately distributed, it is said, principally to persons connected with the Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. I have yet to see a copy of this issue, but the same person is the authority for its actuality who informed me of the similar printing of The Dog's Tale, and who afterward furnished me a copy of same, so I cannot doubt his word especially since he was an employee of the publishers, and was concerned with the actual printing and handling of the books. The story originally appeared in Harper's Magazine for August and September 1906, and the pamphlet listed above was probably printed in the same year. The title page of the trade edition is as follows, A Horse's Tale by Mark Twain, New York and London, Harper and Brothers Publishers, MCMVII. The book, was published October 14, 1907. The English edition is identical with the exception of London and New York on the title, and printed in the United States of America on copyright page. 1907. Christian Science with Notes Containing Corrections to Date by Mark Twain. New York and London, Harper and Brothers Publishers. Copyrighted January 22, 1907. Published February 7, 1907. English edition simultaneously published and identical, with the exception of London and New York on title page, and printed in the United States of America on copyright page. 1907. The Wit and Humor of America, edited by Kate Milner Rabb, Volume 5, Indianapolis, The Bob's Merrill Company, Publishers. These are selections from contributions to Nevada and San Francisco newspapers in the middle 60s, they are contemporary with the sketches included in The Jumping Frog, 1867, and therefore evidently not of enough literary merit for their author to include in his collected works. However, they are very interesting as showing average specimens of Mark Twain's earliest literary effort, especially since practically the only available files of those early newspapers have since been destroyed by the great San Francisco fire. Wit and Humor of America was published September 12, 1907. 1907. The Savage Club, a medley of history, anecdote, and reminiscence. By Aaron Watson, with a chapter by Mark Twain. London, T. Fisher Unwin, Adelphi Terrace. Chapter XII, comprising pages 131 to 135, is contributed by Mark Twain. Chapter XI contains some anecdotes and notes of speeches under the heading Artemis Ward and Mark Twain. 1909. Is Shakespeare Dead? From My Autobiography, Mark Twain. Harper and Brothers Publishers, New York and London, MCMIX. Copyright April 5, 1909. Published April 8, 1909. The London edition is identical with the New York issue with the edition of printed in the U.S. of America, stamped at foot of copyright page. However, most of the copies for England were recalled, and after the final leaf of text there was inserted, tipped in, an extra leaf of advertisements of The Shakespeare Problem Restated by George G. Greenwood, M.P., and In Re Shakespeare Problem by the same author. This was to obviate an action by John Lane, the publishers, alleging want of credit for the quotations by Twain from Greenwood. 1909. The Lectures of Bret Hart, compiled from various sources, to which is added The Piracy of Bret Hart's Fables by Charles Meeker Cosley. 
Printed and published by Charles Meeker Cosley, Brooklyn, New York. Contains Mark Twain letter, pages 48 to 51, contributed to The Spectator, concerning Hotton's pirated English editions. This letter was for the public and so included here, and not in letters. 1909. Extract from Captain Stormfield's Visit to Heaven by Mark Twain. New York and London, Harper and Brothers, MCMIX. Copyrighted and published October 14, 1909. English edition identical, plus stamp on copyright page, printed in the United States. N.D. Laughing Gas, a repository of fun, wit, and humor by Dr. J.J. J. Villers, the celebrated American humorist. New York, J. S. Ogilvie and Company. The book seems to be in two parts, numbered separately, Laughing Gas, page 3 to 32, and Salt, Pepper, and Mustard, or Mirth for the Million, pages 3 to 24. The book was evidently issued in the 70s, but I cannot vouch for its exact original form. None of the articles are signed by Mark Twain, but Putting Up Stoves, page 18, has been signed by him when published in the Heptasoft magazine. From the style of several other stories therein, I am inclined to think that they are some of Mark Twain's early writings for California newspapers, notably The Legal Way, Seafaring, Sewing on a Button, Salt, Pepper, and Mustard, A Mysterious Box, Late News from England. End of Letters and End of Section 4《セクション5 of Excerpts from a Bibliography of the Work of Mark Twain by Merle Johnson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by John Greenman. Speeches Mr. Clemens has made hundreds of speeches on all manner of occasions. His lecture tours have covered continents, and his after-dinner efforts would have brought him fame had he never written a line. Most of his speeches have been carefully prepared literary efforts. Some have been included in his books. Others have been wholly impromptu, and in general, wholly delightful. The main objection to listing these speeches in this very serious bibliography we find to be not in the original matter of the speeches, but in the manner of their reporting. We have these speeches, with a few grateful exceptions, only through the medium of newspapers and their reporters. A reporter is not always a stenographer, and even if so, his report is apt to be altered and trimmed to suit the taste of an editor or the exigencies of space. If the speech is reported from memory or by longhand, then the fine shades of expression used in the speech are almost sure to be lost, and only the blunter of points made are set down, and then much altered by the recorder. Some even seize the occasion to foist on the innocent public some of their own jokes as original Twain. I remember on one occasion listening to a speech which to my mind contained one particular bright scintillating gem of humor and keenness. With curiosity I opened the papers next morning, and not one report of that speech contained that particular gem, which had taken some minutes in the telling. The list is necessarily far from complete, and can be indefinitely extended by earnest searchers through newspaper files in this and other countries, with perhaps some slight aid through the chronology given in the notes for this book. The following books, given in chronological order, contain Mark Twain speeches without other Mark Twain material. A full collation is given for only the climax item, Mark Twain speeches, 1910, which reprints almost all of the speeches given in the previous books, with the addition of over eighty others. Edmund Burke on Tammany and Crocker is listed elsewhere, as it was not primarily intended for an address. Other books listed elsewhere containing speeches are Eccentricities of Genius, Mark Twain, His Life and Work, and Extracts from the Minutes and Report of the Robert Fulton Monument Association. The Bulletin of the Society of American Authors for December 1900, which contains a speech, can hardly be called a book. It is said that Mark Twain's Pretoria speech in 1896 was printed in book form. 
but I have not seen it. N. D. Mark Twain's Speeches on Accident Insurance First page carries title with insurance company seal at top, and the next two pages carry the speech as later reprinted in Sketches New and Old, 1875, with a few additional lines descriptive of the banquet to Mr. Walford. Last page carries list of insurance company officers. N. D. The Fun Library is a collection of humorous stories, ludicrous incidents of travel, anecdotes, and fun items from brightest sources of current wit and humor. Boston, J. H. and A. L. Brigham. On page 54 is printed Opening Remarks of Mark Twain's Lectures, and on page 61, Mark Twain's Wooing. The latter anecdote is of no importance here, as it has been printed so many times elsewhere. Address Before the Ancient and Honorable Artillery Company, Boston, 1875. I have not inspected this item personally. 1876. Seventy-first anniversary celebration of the New England Society in the city of New York at Delmonico's, December 22, 1876. Contains Mark Twain's reply to the toast, The Oldest Inhabitant, New England Weather, pages 50 to 54. This is generally quoted as speech on the weather. 1879. Report of the Proceedings of the Society of the Army of the Tennessee at the 13th Annual Meeting held at Chicago, Illinois, November 12th and 13th, 1879. Printed by F. W. Freeman. This book contains a short Mark Twain speech, page 50, and a longer one, The Babies, pages 154 to 157. 1881. Reunion of the Army of the Potomac. Address by Clemens. I have not inspected this item personally. 1881. First Annual Festival of the New England Society of Pennsylvania at the Continental Hotel, Philadelphia, December 22, 1881. Mark Twain's address appears pages 54 to 59, and has been later entitled Plymouth Rock and the Pilgrims. 1882. Seventy-seventh anniversary celebration of the New England Society in the city of New York at Delmonico's, December 22, 1882. Mark Twain's address fills pages 39 to 42. Other remarks by him are on page 75. 1884. Life of Oliver Wendell Holmes by E. E. Brown, author of Life of Garfield, Life of Washington, From Night to Light, etc., etc., Boston, D. Lothrop and Company. Published March 31, 1884, pages 162 to 165, contain the Mark Twain speech at the Holmes Breakfast, August 29, 1879, later captioned Unconscious Plagiarism. 1886. International Copyright. Statements made before the Committee on Patents of the United States Senate relating to the bill to establish an international copyright and the bill, S. 1178, to amend Title 60, Chapter 3 of the Revised Statutes of the United States. Mr. Clemens's statement is given pages 15 to 17. 1888. Werner's Readings and Recitations, Number 30. Electrocutionary Studies, compiled and arranged by Anna Randall Deal, New York, Edgar S. Werner, Publishing and Supply Company. Copyright 1888 by Edgar S. Werner. Mark Twain's speech, General Grant's English, appears on page 74. 1890. Wise, Witty, Eloquent Kings of the Platform and Pulpit by Melville D. Landon. Biographies, Reminiscences, and Lectures of Five Lines of Three Names Each, and The Master Lectures of Five Lines of Three Names Each, and Personal Reminiscences and Anecdotes of Noted Americans. Chicago, The Wabash Publishing Company, 1890. Mark Twain anecdotes and speeches fill pages 348 to 359. Of these, the Papyrus Club Boston reply to the toast, The Ladies, is first printing in book form. This speech is not the one listed under the same title in Sketches New and Old, 1875. Published September 25, 1890. 1890, Werner's Readings and Recitations, Number 5, American Classics. 
compiled and arranged by Sarah Sigourney Rice. New York, Edgar S. Werner, 1891. On pages 91 and 92 is printed A Ghost Story by Mark Twain. This is the tale known as The Golden Arm, used by Mark Twain in his early lectures, and retold in How to Tell a Story. 1895, A Brief History of the Lotus Club by John Elderkin, Clubhouse, New York. Those first bound up carry list of Lotus Club members at back. Two Mark Twain speeches are quoted in part, pages 15 and 114 to 117. 1900, Masterpieces of American Eloquence, Christian Herald Selection, with introduction by Julia Ward Howe, New York, The Christian Herald, Louis Klops, Proprietor, 1900. Mark Twain Speeches, The Discounts of an Author, pages 428 to 430, and An Author's Soldiering, pages 438 to 440. First was an address at a banquet of ex-Confederate and Union soldiers in New York City, October 12, 1890, and the second an address at a banquet of the Union veterans in Baltimore. 1901. Modern Eloquence. Editor Thomas B. Reed, Justin McCarthy, Rossiter Johnson, Albert Ellergy Berg, Associate Editors. Volume 1. After Dinner Speeches. The University Society, New York. Published June 29, 1901. Volume 1 contains Mark Twain's speech, A Literary Episode, pages 214 to 218. This speech was delivered at the Whittier Birthday Dinner at the Hotel Brunswick, Boston, Massachusetts, December 17, 1877. Volume 4 contains Mark Twain's lecture, delivered during 1877, The Sandwich Islands, sometimes known as Hawaii pages 253 to 259. Volume 5 contains Mark Twain's remarks introducing Charles Kingsley, Boston, February 17, 1874, pages 691 to 693. 1901, Speeches at the Lotus Club, arranged by John Elderkin, Chester S. Lord Horatio N. Fraser, New York, privately printed, MCMI. It announces, Of this book there have been printed from type in the month of March 1901, 900 copies on specially made paper and 100 copies on Van Gelder handmade paper. I have not seen one of the 100 numbered copies. On pages 374 to 379 appears Mark Twain's speech at the dinner in his honor on November 10, 1900. Mark Twain's Birthday, Report of the Celebration of the 67th Thereof at the Metropolitan Club, New York, November 28, 1902. Privately printed and distributed, probably 300 copies issued, Mark Twain's speech occupies pages 41 to 49. 1905, Mark Twain's 70th Birthday, Souvenir of its Celebration, copyright 1905 by Harper and Brothers without covers, given as supplement to Harper's Weekly for December 23, 1905, copyrighted December 13, 1905, published December 19, 1905. Mark Twain's speech is given pages 3 to 4. 1906. Copyright hearings, December 7 to 11, 1906. Arguments before the Committee on Patents of the Senate and House of Representatives, co-jointly, on the bills S6330 and H.R. 19853, to amend and consolidate the acts respecting copyright, December 7th, 8th, 10th, and 11th, 1906, Washington Government Printing Office, 1906. Mr. Clemens' argument is found on pages 116 to 121. 1906, Mark Twain on Simplified Spelling, a speech at the annual dinner of the Associated Press held in New York, September 19, 1906, revised expressly for the Simplified Spelling Board, issued without covers, single sheet folded once, making four pages of text. 1907. The American Society in London, report of the speeches at the Independence Day Banquet, July 4, 1907, held at the Hotel Cecil, London. Mark Twain's speech appears pages 14 through 18. 1908. 
dinner in honor of the honorable whitelaw reed american ambassador to the court of st james by the pilgrims of the united states on wednesday the nineteenth of february one thousand nine hundred and eight at delmonico's new york mark twain's speech appears on pages thirty to thirty five nineteen ten mark twain's speeches with an introduction by william dean howells new york and london harper and brothers publishers nineteen ten published june twenty first nineteen ten end of section five speeches section six of excerpts from a bibliography of the work of mark twain samuel langhorne clemens by merle johnson this LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by John Greenman. Letters Some of us become greatly miffed if our old letters are made public. Literary people are not so sensitive, and the following extract from Chapters from My Autobiography in the North American Review of September 21, 1906, gives Mr. Clemens personal attitude on the question. This is from this morning's paper mark twain letter sold written to thomas nast it proposed a joint tour a mark twain autograph letter brought forty three dollars yesterday at the auction by the merwin clayton company of the library and correspondence of the late thomas nast the cartoonist the letter is nine pages note paper is dated Hartford, November 12, 1877, and is addressed to Nast. It reads in part as follows. Dot, dot, dot. This is as it should be. This is worthy of all praise. I say it myself, lest other competent persons should forget to do it. It appears that four of my ancient letters were sold at auction three of them at twenty seven dollars twenty eight dollars and twenty nine dollars respectively and the one above mentioned at forty three dollars there is one very gratifying circumstance about this to wit that my literature has more than held its own as regards money value through this stretch of thirty-six years I judge that the $43 letter must have gone at about ten cents a word, whereas if I had written it today, its market rate would be thirty cents. So I have increased in value two or three hundred percent. I note another gratifying circumstance, that a letter of General Grant's sold at something short of eighteen dollars i can't rise to general grant's lofty place in the estimation but it is a deep happiness to me to know that when it comes to epistolary literature he can't sit in the front seat along with me nine years ago when we were living in tedworth square london a report was cabled to the american journals that i was dying i was not the one it was another clemens a cousin of mine the london representatives of the american papers began to flock in with american cables in their hands to inquire into my condition the next man was also an irishman he had his new york cable in his hand it said if mark twain dying send five hundred words if dead send a thousand now that old letter of mine sold yesterday for forty three dollars when i am dead it will be worth eighty six eighteen seventy seven seventy-second anniversary celebration of the new england society in the city of new york at delmonico's December 22, 1877. Letter of Regret from Mark Twain, page 84. 1880. The reception given to Thurlow Weed on his 83rd birthday by the New York Press Club. 
for private distribution albany weed parsons and company printers eighteen eighty a three-line letter of no importance is given page twenty three eighteen eighty some funny things a careful selection of funny sketches from the pens of such well-known writers as the detroit free press man the burlington hawkeye man the danbury newsman the norriston herald man and a number of other funny men new york frank harrison and company an anecdote starting a paper including a mark twain letter is on pages forty nine to fifty two eighteen eighty nine camden's compliment to walt whitman may thirty first eighteen eighty nine notes addresses letters telegrams edited by horace l trowell philadelphia david mckay publisher an open letter from mark twain is printed on pages sixty four to sixty five it is not in his happiest vein eighteen ninety one portraits and autographs an album for the people edited by w t stead the review of reviews a sixpenny monthly london mowbray house facsimile letter from clemens to stead page sixty three eighteen ninety four the diversions of an autograph hunter by j h london elliot stock the frontispiece is a facsimile of a mark twain letter and the history of the letter is given pages sixty one to sixty three nineteen o four cat stories retold by st nicholas edited by m h carter department of science of the new york training school for teachers new york the century company on page four is a letter from mark twain about his cats reprinted from st nicholas where it was addressed to one edwin wildman nineteen o four thomas nast his period and his pictures by albert bigelow payne new york the macmillan company london macmillan and company limited all rights reserved letters from mark twain are printed pages two sixty three three sixty seven to three sixty eight and five thirteen one of them concerning a joint lecture tour projected by twain and nast special performance of hansel and gretel by the conried metropolitan opera company for the benefit of the legal aid society at the metropolitan opera house thursday evening march fifteenth nineteen o six contains mark twain letter pages twenty four through twenty six nineteen o six history of the ohio society of new york eighteen eighty five to nineteen o five prepared and compiled under the direction of henry l burnett warren higley leander h crawl committee on publication by james h kennedy historian of the society the grafton press new york m c m v i short and unimportant mark twain letter page three forty one nineteen o seven extracts from the minutes and report of the robert fulton monument association from its inception for presentation at the annual meeting held in the stateroom at the waldorf astoria on november fourteenth nineteen o seven at three thirty p m mark twain's speech pages forty nine through fifty mark twain letters pages seventy five and eighty seven nineteen o eight the life of thomas bailey aldrich by ferris greenslet cambridge printed at the riverside press m d c c c v i i i large paper edition of five hundred copies pages ninety five through ninety nine contain several letters from twain to aldrich nineteen o nine letters and opinions of letters of a japanese schoolboy this is not a title page as given but my own caption for a pamphlet announcement of mr wallace irwin's book published by doubleday page and company nineteen o nine the pamphlet on the second page carries a letter of appreciation from mark twain nineteen ten stories of authors british and american by edwin watts chubb professor of english literature in the ohio university new york sturgis and walton company nineteen ten all rights reserved the story of mark twain's debts fills pages three hundred and forty nine to three hundred and fifty seven and contains a portion of a letter together with a small amount of anecdotal material books listed elsewhere containing mark twain letters are mark twain his life and work eccentricities of genius and charles dickens by pen and pencil the following periodicals contain mark twain letters california mailbag may eighteen seventy three harper's magazine may eighteen ninety six 
Ladies' Home Journal, October 1898, Ainsley's, August 1900, Army and Navy Journal, March 1901, Papyrus, March 1905, Harper's Weekly, August 25, 1905, October 21, 1905, December 15, 1905, March 24, 1906, May 26, 1906, March 27, 1909, Collier's Weekly, September 22, 1906, July 6, 1908, August 8, 1908. The following New York newspapers print Mark Twain letters. Times, March 12, 1898. Journal, June 25, 1900. World, January 24, 1901. Journal, August 19, 1902. Tribune, March 31, 1903. Herald, August 16, 1903. World, October 22, 1903. Herald, January 14, 1904. Times, May 15, 1905. Times, November 5, 1906. American, December 21, 1907. Sun, January 12, 1908. Times, March 30, 1908. Tribune, June 9, 1908. American, August 4, 1909. Catalogues containing Mark Twain letters are as follows. George D. Smith's Catalog of Autographs, 1903, Mark Twain Letters, pages 21 and 23. Anderson Auction Company's Catalog for December 3, 1907, Mark Twain Inscription, page 26. Anderson Auction Company's Catalog for January 20, 1908, Mark Twain Presentation Inscription, page 20. Anderson Auction Company's Catalog for March 17, 1908, Mark Twain Letters, page 8. Anderson Auction Company's Catalog for May 15, 1908, Mark Twain Letters, page 8. Anderson Auction Company's Catalog for December 9th through 10th, 1909, Mark Twain Letter, page 18. Germantown Hospital Book Sale Catalog for 1906, Mark Twain Facsimile Inscription Plate after page 22, Mark Twain Inscriptions, pages 50 and 51. End of section 6. Letters. Section 7 of Excerpts from a Bibliography of the Work of Mark Twain by Merle Johnson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by John Greenman. Section 7. Anecdotes. In this section is given the anecdotal Twain material that has achieved the importance of book production. In each age the foremost storyteller is credited with numerous tales he never fathered, the relators of these spurious efforts seeking to gain a hearing by attributing them to the master creation. As Lincoln once said, was followed by, Mark Twain tells this one. The one anecdotal book that is important, certified, and certain is My Mark Twain, 1910, by Twain's close literary friend of forty-four years, William Dean Howells. 1882. Famous Funny Fellows, Brief Biographical Sketches of American Humorists, by Will M. Clemens. Cleveland, Ohio, William W. Williams, 1882. Contains short sketch of Mark Twain, including a few letters, etc., pages 11 through 23, but most of the material therein is repeated and expanded to much better effect in the author's later book, Mark Twain, His Life and Work, 1892. 1883. Wit and Humor of the Age, comprising wit, humor, pathos, ridicule, satires, dialects, puns, conundrums, riddles, charades, jokes, and magic, by Mark Twain, Robert J. Burdett, Josh Billings, Alexander Sweet, Eli Perkins, with the philosophy of wit and humor by Melville D. Landon, A.M., Chicago, Western Publishing House, 1883, pages 194, 95, 96, contains story alleged to have been related by Mark Twain about his fast horse, same as found in Gripsack Gleanings, number 3. In justice to Mr. Clemens, it must be stated that Mr. Landon had a free habit of trading on his brother humorists without sufficient accuracy of quotation, and in one book, Eli Perkins at Large, 
even went so far as to include a long article headed how eli perkins lectured at pottsville by mark twain which he landon admitted writing himself in its entirety eighteen eighty nine the people i've smiled with recollections of a merry little life by marshall p wilder cassell and company limited new york one short anecdote chestnuts is given page one thirty seven and one about augustine daly's dog pages one ninety four to ninety eight purports to be the report of a speech at the one hundredth night dinner of the taming of the shrew in new york this last was retold by mark twain in following the equator eighteen ninety seven pages four fifteen to twenty five eighteen ninety one eli perkins thirty years of wit and reminiscences of witty wise and eloquent men by melville d landon eli perkins new york cassell publishing company mark twain anecdotes on pages twelve thirteen eighty six eighty seven eighty eight nineteen hundred five famous missourians authenticates biographical sketches of samuel l clemens richard p bland champ clark james m greenwood and joseph o shelby by wilfred r hollister and harry norman with introductories by walter williams hon champ clark hon joseph w bailey professor john r kirk and mrs t j henry kansas city missouri hudson kimberly publishing nineteen hundred the sketch of mark twain fills pages seven through eighty six it contains but little literary material and is far less important than will m clemens book nineteen o two two hundred after-dinner stories as told by many american humorists copyright nineteen o two by j s ogilvy publishing company new york mark twain anecdotes page six fifteen fifty eight one thirteen one sixteen one forty three one seventy nine two twelve two forty seven and two ninety four nineteen o two the man in the street stories from the new york times containing over six hundred humorous after-dinner stories about prominent persons with an introductory by chauncey m depew copyright nineteen o two by j s ogilvy publishing company new york contains mark twain anecdotes pages fifty eight one thirteen one sixteen one forty three one seventy nine two twelve two forty seven and two ninety four nineteen o two authors of our day in their homes personal descriptions and interviews edited with additions by francis whitting halsey new york james pot and company m c m i i pages twenty three through thirty five contain mark twain in riverdale on the hudson and in hartford connecticut this has small amount of literary and anecdotal material nineteen o four after-dinner stories compiled and edited by c m dolliver comprising the latest and best stories of america's brightest wits ten lines of speakers names j s ogilvy publishing company new york copyright nineteen o four by will rossiter on pages eight through nine are three anecdotes of mark twain nineteen o four autobiography memories and experiences of moncure daniel conway in two volumes boston and new york houghton mifflin company the riverside press cambridge nineteen o four first printing limited to one hundred copies and signed by the author mark twain anecdotes pages one forty two to one forty six volume two nineteen o five after dinner stories compiled by e c lewis the mutual book company publishers boston massachusetts mark twain anecdotes pages seven twelve fourteen eighteen and twenty nineteen o seven in lighter vein a collection of anecdotes witty sayings bon mots bright repartees eccentricities and reminiscences of well-known men and women who are or have been prominent in the public eye collected edited and presented to the public by john de morgan author of literary side of the presidents homes and haunts of british authors heroes of the cromwellian era etc paul elder and company san francisco and new york mark twain anecdotes pages one forty four one forty five one forty six 
1908. Reminiscences of Senator William M. Stewart of Nevada, edited by George Rathwell Brown. New York and Washington, The Neal Publishing Company, 1908. On pages 219 to 24 is an alleged account of the writing of Innocents Abroad as remembered by Senator Stewart. He writes with an apparent bias that will not please the admirer of Twain. 1908. Authentic and brilliant after-dinner stories and repartee, gleanings from the most gifted after-dinner speakers of the day. The Arthur Westbrook Company, Cleveland, USA. Mark Twain Anecdote, page 48. 1908. A Bunch of Lemons, Collected, Condemned, and Cussed by A. Few Lemons. H. M. Caldwell Company, New York, Boston. Mark Twain Anecdote, page 59. 1910. My Mark Twain, Reminiscences and Criticisms by W. D. Howells, Harper and Brothers Publishers, New York and London, 1910, published September 10, 1910. The high quality and importance of this anecdotal book is no more than could be expected of Mark Twain's closest and oldest literary friend. The reminiscences were written after Mr. Clemens' death and published in three numbers of Harper's Magazine from July, 1910. The criticisms are collected reviews of Mark Twain's books from magazines of different periods. For one who wishes a grasp of Mark Twain's personality, it will form a necessary supplement to Will M. Clemens' incomplete life, and may even have a nearer personal touch than Mr. Albert Bigelow Payne's biography, though, of course, not in any way so comprehensive as the latter work will be. N.D. The Fun Library is a collection of humorous stories, ludicrous incidents of travel, anecdotes, and fun items, from brightest sources of current wit and humor. Boston, J. H. and A. L. Brigham. Otherwise, Gripsack Gleanings, Number 3. On page 7 is an anecdote. Mr. Mark Twain, he tells about a very fast horse he once drove. The same anecdote is given in Wit and Humor of the Age. End of section 7 anecdotes. Section 8 of Excerpts from a Bibliography of the Work of Mark Twain by Merle Johnson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by John Greenman. Section 8. Notes. Those who value Mr. Clemens's speeches and fugitive efforts will find use for the appended chronology of his various residences and travels as an aid for search in newspaper files and other local sources. 1861-64 to 64 in Nevada, in summer of 1864 to San Francisco, 1865 in California, in 1866 a trip to Hawaii, then back to San Francisco, 1867 across the Isthmus to New York, thence to Washington, back to New York, sailing in June on Quaker City trip to the Orient. 1868 in Washington, thence in March to San Francisco, and back in September to New York, in fall of 1869 to Buffalo, balancing between Buffalo and Elmira until the fall of 1870, removing to Hartford. In July 1871 to England, most of 1872 and 1873, between London and Hartford, 1874 to 1877 in Hartford, with summers in Elmira, winter of 1877 to 78 in Chicago, then to Europe, 1879 in England, France, and Germany, until September, then back to U.S., 1880 until 1890, mainly in Hartford, with summer changes, mostly to Elmira, home of Mrs. Clemens, most of 1891-92-93-94 in Europe, wintering in Aix-les-Bains, Berlin, Florence, and Paris in turn. 1895 to Europe, then back for a lecture tour of U.S., leaving Vancouver in August for round-the-world trip, reaching England in August, thence to Vienna in September. Early part of 1897 in London, in July to Switzerland, thence to Vienna, 1898 and 1899, mainly in Europe, first in Austria, then in England, with summer of 99 in Sweden. 
nineteen hundred in new york with trip to london then back to new york nineteen o one in riverdale on the hudson saranac in the summer nineteen o two in riverdale trip to missouri in may june and york harbor maine in the fall nineteen o three riverdale leaving in october for italy nineteen o four in florence italy until june thence to lee massachusetts and in the winter to new york city nineteen o five new york city dublin new hampshire in fall new york city in nineteen o six winter trip to bermuda returns from bermuda in spring to tuxedo then in july to england then back to tuxedo and new york nineteen o eight early months in bermuda thence to new york and on june eighteenth to redding connecticut nineteen o nine in redding on november eighteenth to bermuda returning on december eighteenth nineteen ten on january fifth to bermuda returning to end his career in redding on april twenty first there are no doubt other excursions of which i have no record twain's first article in the enterprise was a burlesque on a lecture by chief justice george turner in carson city the latter part of eighteen sixty one turner was very much of an egotist and twain called his skit the lecture of mr personal pronoun his first letters from esmeralda to the enterprise were signed josh and were only three or four in number he went to work regularly on the enterprise in the fall of eighteen sixty two mr john camden houghton the english publisher justified the inclusion of several sketches in his editions which mark twain repudiated by claiming that mark wrote for the buffalo express over the nom de plume carl bing a book to be listed by the future bibliographer of twain is albert bigelow payne's biography of mark twain which is first to take serial form in the north american review mr howells proposes to publish a volume of letters from mr clemens to himself and another compilation of twain letters in general is possible it is claimed that mr clemens wrote a certain skit of exaggerated tendencies entitled a poet's epistle to the society of the mammoth god i cannot vouch for it sketches old and new on the cover and sketches new and old on the title page that's a twister the following items generally credited to mark twain have nothing of first edition interest the traveling innocents mark twain's pleasure trip on the continent men and things women and things a little nonsense the primrose way an unexpected acquaintance yankee drolleries idle notes of an idle excursion english as she is instructed mark twain's nightmare choice bits and mark twain's birthday book mark twain's scrapbook is a patented pasting device not a literary production the literary guillotine was not written or collaborated in by mr clemens an unexpected acquaintance is merely an excerpt from the tramp abroad to my guests greeting and salutation and prosperity was the heading of a printed letter given each visitor to mark twain's home in stormfield it was an appeal for aid to the reading public library beadle's dime dialogues number no. ten contains mrs mark twain's shoe a four-page dialogue i cannot think mark twain wrote it mr clemens has been interviewed countless times by newspaper and magazine writers his refreshing and original views always made good reading for the public he could be grave or gay as suited the topic it became so the custom in new york for the editors to send reporters to him on any and all occasions that he was forced to draw the line limiting them to the day of his departure for some distant point and the day of his return the same questions arise in regard to interviews as with speeches chiefly as to accuracy of reporting i once saw a scrapbook containing newspaper interviews which had been submitted to mr clemens by some ardent admirer and the author had margined it with his comments some had merely a confirmatory ok others had more extended comments and but one was denied in toto 
Surely Mr. Clemens found a far less percentage of mendacious journalism than others of our public men. On the one interview which he did not choose to remember giving to the press, which purported to be a reply to a society leader's previous article, he margined, in effect, I would be as apt to discuss this with Mrs. A as with a cat. Here is Mark Twain's own idea of the interview as he has met it. I have, in my time, succeeded in writing some very poor stuff, which I have put in pigeonholes until I realized how bad it was and then destroyed it. But I think the very poorest article I ever wrote and destroyed was better worth reading than any interview with me that was ever published. I would like just once to interview myself in order to show the possibilities of the interview. For those who wish to pursue the question of interviews, a short and typical list is given below, altogether from New York newspapers. 1900, World, June 16th. World, October 14th. Herald, October 16th. World, October 21st. 1901, Herald, January 20th. Journal, March 14th. Journal, October 9th. Herald, October 14th. 1902, Herald, June 15th. World, September 7th. 1903, Herald, June 15th. 1905, American, August 30th. Herald, November 12th. American, November 26th and 28th. World, December 3rd. 1906, Herald, January 30th. Herald, March 11th. American, March 18th. American, December 7th. World, December 16th. 1907, American, May 5th. Press, May 9th. American, May 26th. Times, May 12th. American, June 8th. Sun, June 19th. American, June 23rd. Times, June 30th. World, July 13th. Times, American, World, Tribune, July 23rd. World, August 25th. 1908, Journal, February 23rd. American, April 14th. Journal, September 27th. 1909, World, October 7th. 1910, Journal, December 20th. Here is a short list of periodicals containing the more important articles, not by Twain, but interviews, collections of anecdotes, and the like. Idler, February 1892. Californian, July 1893. Harper's Magazine, May 1896. McClure, January 1898. Ainsley's, August 1900, Review of Reviews, January 1901, Criterion, August 1901, Sketch, March 30, 1904, Metropolitan, March 1904, Gunters, April 1905, Outing, October 1907, Black and White, January 29, 1908, Pacific Monthly, March 1908, Country Life in America, April 1909, Harper's Magazine, May 1909, Bookman, June 1910. Mr. Howells, in My Mark Twain, 1910, gives the story of the dramatization of the Gilded Age, the play being known as Mulberry Sellers or Colonel Sellers. It seems that the original play was the work of an unknown dramatist who adapted from Mark Twain's book. Twain and Howells undertook to write a continuation of that play. It was staged for one week. Other dramatizations from Twain books have been Puddinhead Wilson and The Prince and the Pauper. I believe one E. H. House had to do with the dramatization of the latter, but cannot give further facts or tell whether actual collaboration was done by Mr. Clemens, and I have vainly searched for any printed copies of those plays. 
Belford's magazine for December 1890 gives a small portion of The Prince and the Pauper in dramatic form. Mark Twain is said to have contributed several stories to some publication advertising a certain western railroad at an early period of his career. I cannot confirm this. Good Things, Gathering of Scraps, Side Splitters, and Funniest Fiction have all been wrongly listed as books. They are merely sub-captions for screamers and eye-openers. The original outside paper wrapper of Mark Twain's speeches, 1910, set forth as one of the items in the book the address delivered at the Aldridge Memorial Meeting. That particular speech had been omitted from the contents as no good report of it could be found. The Boston transcript for November 27, 1872, prints two interesting Mark Twain items. It seems that the steamer Batavia, on which the humorist was returning from England, chanced to pick up some shipwrecked mariners. The passengers of the Batavia wished to memorialize the Royal Humane Society in behalf of the heroic rescuers, and also desired to express their commendations directly to the officers of the ship, and in both cases Mark Twain was persuaded to compose the documents. Once upon a time Eleanor Glynn, she of the weeks, enjoyed a little talk with Mr. Clemens. She straightway sent to the printer her collections of what Mr. Clemens had said, distributing the pamphlet so produced among her friends. Through carelessness on her part, or her press agents, one of said pamphlets turned up in a newspaper office and was sent out for the world to read, greatly to the annoyance and abjurgation of its purported relator, who in haste and with vehemence denounced the publication as a garbled and unauthentic affair. When I list in the index a story, say, An Adventure of Huckleberry Finn, and refer to the book in which it later appears, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, pages such and such, I do not guarantee that the story is included word for word in the book exactly as it appeared in the magazine. Naturally, these stories were edited, and in many cases quite considerable changes made before book publication. Some Mark Twain stories appeared in newspapers, and in changed and edited form were included in one of his books as Innocence Abroad or Roughing It. Later, someone has lifted the story verbatim from the original newspaper in dodging the copyright law, thereby making a differently worded book edition from the authorized version. I have listed no such publications. Here is a contributed note which I have not had opportunity to follow up. Years agone, a murderer by the name of Ruloff was condemned to be hung in New York. He was an eminent scholar, a professor of something or other, and his was a celebrated case. Just before his execution, Mark Twain wrote a letter to the Tribune, which dwelt upon the condemned man's extraordinary learning, set forth how great a loss to humanity his putting away would be, and with an air of sincerity offered to take his place on the gallows, being actuated from altruistic motives. It is said the generous offer was not seriously considered in official circles. Another note from a correspondent, this time concerning the Toronto edition of An Idle Excursion, on page 16 a sentence has been left out at the end of the fourth line from the last, marring the climax of chapter one. It should read, Could not fail of the importance. The chronometer of God never errs. This may prove of considerable interest if it should ever be discovered that an idle excursion antedated Punch Brothers Punch. One of my collector friends has a volume edited by or for Eugene Field, with title of The Stag Party. A pencil note over one of the stories included anonymously attributes it to Mark Twain. A mere perusal of the story, however, is almost a complete refutation of such a claim. Mark Twain lapsed but seldom into poetry. A Memory in the Galaxy, August 1870, gives his first youthful effort as a parody on Hiawatha. The Miner's Lament also appeared in the Galaxy. The Aged Pilot Man, in Roughing It is a parody on The Ancient Mariner, and The Mysterious Chinaman, which has never been dignified by book or magazine printing, was adapted from Poe's Lenore. In Memoriam, written in 1897, 
is a serious and dignified tribute to his daughter susan hot stuff is merely one of the countless collections of wit and humor and the choate story-book was edited by will m clemens not samuel l clemens both have been credited to mark twain in certain checklists ward locke and company's edition of mark twain some of them in what was termed beaton's library are invariably reprints of earlier english issues in his preface to innocence abroad mark twain refers to letters written to daily alta california new york tribune and the new york herald which he afterward incorporated in the book above mentioned most of these letters appeared in eighteen sixty seven in the journals named but i have not had the opportunity to obtain the exact dates several newspaper articles notably in the buffalo express were incorporated in roughing it and it is said that the new york sun printed letters later used in a tramp abroad mr clemens attitude toward illustrators and college men was typical of newspaper editors of his time since then employers have learned to recognize and even stimulate merit in those unfortunate classes dan beard contributed the following to the new york american concerning his first meeting with mark twain to discuss the illustration of a book mr beard endeavors to give in type a representation of mark's peculiar drawl mr beard i do not want to inflict any mental agony upon you nor subject you to any undue suffering but i do wish you'd read the book before you make the pictures i assured him that i had already read the manuscripts thoroughly three times and he replied by opening a prominent magazine at his elbow to a very beautiful picture of an old gentleman with a smooth face which the text described as having a flowing white beard remarking as he did so from a a casual reference to the current magazines i did not suppose that was the usual custom with illustrators now mr beard you know my character of the yankee he is a common uneducated man he's a good telegraph operator he can make a colt's revolver or a remington gun but he's a perfect ignoramus he's a good foreman for a manufacturer can survey land and run a locomotive in other words he has neither the refinement nor the weakness of a college education in conclusion i want to say that i have endeavored to put in all the coarseness and vulgarity into the yankee in king arthur's court that is necessary and rely upon you for all that refinement and delicacy of humor which your facile pen can depict glad to have met you mr beard everything that mark twain wrote did not come to the public the temptation for an author of assured success to get real money for inferior stuff must be great but mark twain laid aside a chestful of manuscripts as unworthy and no doubt destroyed many others an instance in point is given by dan beard it was before webster and company failed that ward mcallister's book society as i have found it appeared and when he sauntered into my studio one day i said mr clemens have you read ward mcallister's book yes have you he replied indeed i have i have read it through several times and intend to read it again it is one of the most humorous books i ever read that's so said mark 
that's so now i will tell you something i spent three months writing a satire on that book of ward mcallister's and when i got through i again read mcallister's book and then my satire and then tore the blame thing up some things are complete in themselves and cannot be improved upon and i take off my hat to mcallister to show mark twain's relation to the physical appearance of his books letters from his illustrators are of interest says lucian walcott hitchcock i went to mr clemens's house to see about the horse's tail he had a little old photograph of one of his children who had died when a child and he wanted me to work that little face into the picture of the little girl in the story i asked him if there was any further suggestion he wanted to make about what scenes of the story to take etc but he said no it's just this way about it i find the artist knows more about what will make a good picture than i do what i thought a good subject for a picture isn't worth a hang and something i should not have thought of at all makes a very good one so i will leave all that with you at the same time he gave me a photo of the cats he wanted me to use in the drawing of the old general when the horse's tail drawings were finished i took them down for him to see he came into his study in a bath gown and pipe there was no place to put the drawings where they could be seen but on the floor so the old man dropped down on the floor like a child to look them over he was pleased with them all far beyond their merits he thought the drawing of the child looked like the original and of the moonlight he said a very eloquent horse dan beard writes i would rather work for mark twain than any man i ever met first because his writings are so full of imagination so full of ideas that each paragraph would make a good subject for a picture a cartoon or an illustration second because mark twain himself had a quicker perception and a keener appreciation of thoughtful earnest work than any author for whom i have worked or met third because he was never niggardly with his praise never waited for one to ask him how he liked the illustration but of his own volition and without suggestion from the artist he would take time to sit down and write a personal letter of commendation for the work which pleased him fourth because he did not try to draw the pictures for the illustrator himself as do most authors and publishers said he dan if a man comes to me and says mr clemens i want you to write me a book i'll write it for him but if he comes to me and says he wants me to write a book and then tells me what to write i'll say dang you go hire a typewriter when i had finished the illustrations for the now rare webster edition of the yankee in king arthur's court mark sent me a dignified courtly letter of encouragement and commendation when i finished the book he wrote there are hundreds of artists who could illustrate my other books but there is but one who could illustrate this one what a lucky day i went netting for lightning bugs and caught a meteor live forever mark mr clemens had ideas of his own on the proper illustration of certain books and insisted on their being carried out the contract for pictures to accompany the separate edition of eve's diary had actually been lent to a certain artist whose work had hitherto given great satisfaction when mark interposed with a demand for a different style of work for that particular book it was with considerable effort that the exact style of decorative and allegorical pictures he desired was obtained then again for joan of arc 
he wished nothing humorous but suggested that the pictures convey the sense of mysticism and allegory which he claimed was lacking or only partially indicated in his text claims have been made that the montreal eighteen eighty one edition of the prince and the pauper was the first printing the toronto eighteen eighty two edition of the same title relates in a preface the history of the montreal edition this preface states that mr clemens resided two weeks in canada previous to the montreal appearance and demanded copyright protection as a canadian for his book the courts denied the validity of this procedure and the author fell back on the plea of previous publication in england this would seem to establish the priority of the english issue all mark twain collectors have noted the peculiar and distinctive form taken by the books bearing his name beginning with the innocents abroad and continuing through the larger and more important works this was due to the more or less accidental entering by mark twain of the subscription book field not usually invaded by the better authors in those days nowadays the book agent commonly offers a set of your favorite author in those times before the era of cheap processes of engraving and printing the agent offered a single book destined to repose and state upon the parlor table which was apt to depend more upon the then plenteous number of its engravings and the splendor of its binding than upon any great literary merit within in fact most of these books were of the instructive order travel history and the like the american publishing company to whom the innocents abroad was offered had made a specialty of these subscription books mr elisha bliss the head of the firm signed a contract to produce mark twain's work but on seeking the approval of his board of directors met with opposition the directors fancied that the humorous qualities of mark twain's style would interfere with the sale of the work as a book of travel and it was only at mr bliss's avowal of faith in the author and a personal offer to take over the company's contract that the work proceeded the american publishing company had just made a successful campaign with mr richardson's beyond the mississippi naturally the new book took the form of the previous success with similar typographical features and scheme of illustration people in those days would not pay for blank paper and wide margins says mr frank bliss who was associated with his father in the production of the books they wanted everything filled up with type or pictures when we saw after the first issue of a book a space of several inches at the end of a chapter left blank we generally supplied a cut to fill it in mark twain had nothing at all to do with the matter except the furnishing of some photographs and to smile and approve of the drawings that he happened to see he was thoroughly well pleased and expressed himself so many times with the illustrating of his books elisha bliss jr was a man of fine literary and artistic perceptions who thoroughly appreciated and enjoyed mr clemens's humor and writings and so was able to give many valuable directions in the making of the pictures the artist mr true w williams with the help of an occasional other artist made the drawings as far down as puddenhead wilson he could put mr clemens's ideas into a picture perfectly he could make serious and lovely pictures as well as comic he was a well-read and pleasant fellow whose convivial habits frequently led him astray but these were overcome in the latter years of his life i am happy to say causing mr clemens to declare that he was the greatest combination of hog and angel he ever saw following the evident trail of form and illustration from the richardson book on through the innocents abroad we find the same firm of engravers employed fay and cox this firm had its principal artist mr true williams referred to above after a time the american publishing company disregarded the engraving firm dealt with williams direct took him down to hartford and kept him steadily employed for a number of years he made most of the illustrations for the gilded age and illustrated sketches new and old and adventures of tom sawyer in their entirety after the webster interregnum when the american publishing company came back into the mark twain field mr frank bliss took charge of the production of the books 
Mr. Clemens was not in America in 1894 when Puddinhead Wilson appeared, or in 1897 when Following the Equator was put on the market. Therefore Mr. Bliss alone determined the form of those books. He originated the idea of the marginal illustrations for Puddinhead and hired the various artists who contributed to Following the Equator, practically all the latter set of artists being retained to contribute pictures for the autograph edition. In Nevada, Twain wrote for the Virginia City Enterprise. In California, for the San Francisco Call, the Daily Alta, the Sacramento Union newspapers, and the Californian and Overland magazines. In Buffalo, for the Express, and his last salaried literary labor was for the Galaxy magazine in 1871. End of section 8. Notes. Section 9 of Excerpts from a Bibliography of the Work of Mark Twain by Merle Johnson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by John Greenman. Introduction to Index Many Mark Twain titles have been altered several times by their various editors. The attempt is made here to give each story with its first edition history under the original title. Changed titles are in each case referred back to the original title, though perhaps not noting the book in which the varium was used. Several paragraphs from the Galaxy magazine were not separately captioned in that periodical, titles being supplied by later editors. These paragraphs are listed by these supplied titles, some I have captioned myself, but the searcher must not expect to find the articles in the Galaxy or in memoranda under those exact captions. Printings in periodicals and newspapers appear with the month or day of printing appended, Nevada Enterprise accepted, and in italics, the book printings having the year date only. If only one book printing be given, that may be either American or foreign issue. Reference to the title quoted must determine that. If more than one book printing be given, the first is invariably foreign, the first actual book printing, and the second American, the first American book printing. In each case I endeavor to give the first American edition, even if it has been issued elsewhere previously, but I do not give the foreign printing at all if the American is the real first. The man that corrupted Hadleyburg and the celebrated Jumping Frog are shortened for convenience to Hadleyburg and Jumping Frog. I have endeavored to cross-file thoroughly in order to cover every existing variation, so that the intent of the searcher may not be thwarted by introductory prepositions and the like. Book titles have page references, but story titles must first be referred to the book indicated. Stories which have no book references appended have never been printed in book form to my knowledge. Speeches are listed with the date of delivery, the indexes for the titles of stories and books written by Mark Twain, or the titles of books containing Mark Twain material. Other persons or things touched upon in the bibliography are not listed. End of section 9. Introduction to Index and End of Excerpts from a Bibliography of the Work of Mark Twain by Merle Johnson. Read by John Greenman.